And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. There is power in the prophetic word of God. Have no mistake about it. And things are happening in this world very fast, aren't they? Goodness gracious, you open up the newspapers, you go to the Internet, and you know what happens in one day seems to be about the same amount of amazing things that used to happen in, in a whole year. We're, we're just, everything is cascading downward on us. And I have no doubt, uh, of course, I don't dare name the date because Christ warned us about not naming a date for his return, but he did say we would know the signs. He, he did say we, you know, we should look at the signs and uh, we could discern the seasons. And I think we're in that season, friend. Without a date, I would say that it's close at hand. And God, in his graciousness and his goodness, guess what? He, guess what is the amazing thing? He says in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 10, that in the last days, the carnal people of this world, the unsaved, Unfortunately, they're, they're not even going to understand what's going on. But the wise shall understand. Now, what is the wise? The wise person is one who depends on God for discernment, for knowledge. And without that knowledge, the Bible says, even God's people will perish. We turn to God. We turn to his word. Well, today we're going to be talking about a subject. And by the way, we're going to have the same subject next week because it's huge. It's gargantuan. I wish I had more adjectives. I need to get out my, is it Roger's thesaurus and come up with a bunch of words that mean the same thing as tremendous, gargantuan, gigantic. We're going to be covering a subject that is so powerful. In fact, in a moment, I'm going to introduce my guest, and I'm going to ask him why he believes this subject is so overwhelmingly important to you. But we'll, we'll let the guest address that subject. I have always loved Bible prophecy, and the Bible says that Jesus is the very spirit of prophecy. Now, I know a lot of pastors out there, and they say, well, we don't really understand Bible prophecy, all those symbols, you know, beast and crowns and you know, uh, we, mystery women. I don't understand that stuff. I'm not even going to preach that. Well, that's like slapping God in the face and saying, well, you've given us so much of your Bible and prophecy, but we don't care. We, we, we're just going to let people be dumb. We're not even going to ask you what it means, Lord. Now, I think that is a travesty, and I think pastors and theologians who think like that are certainly not being led by God. If God didn't want you to know what's in the Bible, I suspect he would not have put it in there. <laughs> it's there. He wants you to read it. And the interesting thing is it says there in the book of Revelation that he who reads and keeps the sayings in this book, that means put them in your mind, put them in your heart. The person that does that, the Bible says, will be blessed. I really, I think reading any book in the Bible will, will be, mean a blessing to you. But I don't know of any other book that says, read this one and you'll be blessed. And that Jesus is the very spirit that's in this book. Oh, yes, he inhabits his word. You read his word and, my goodness gracious, you're one with him. This is the amazing thing then. You will be blessed by today's program. You will be blessed by next week's program because it's a two-part series. When I read Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, which is, you might say, the penultimate or the ultimate, I'm always taken to Revelation 17. Here is a history of horror that's going to occur in the last days. And our guest is written an entire book 
that addresses this subject. His book is entitled Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Now I know each of you, you wonderful listeners out there, have your own idea <laughs> about what Revelation 17 has. If you've read it before, I'm going to read it very quickly to you. And maybe my guest, Edward Hendry, well, uh, he might, who knows, he might want to read it again to you. And that's his liberty to do so. It is so vitally important. You see, John was taken away, carried away in the spirit. Have you ever been carried away in the spirit, friends? It's a wonderful thing. And here's what he says. And while he was in the spirit, he saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. Imagine a scarlet colored beast, a woman sitting on it. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet color. She was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now I'm paraphrasing, and I, the King James is the only one I, I believe in. And I want you to, uh, to to think of the King James here. You might even want to get out your Bible if it's handy and read Revelation 17, verses 3 through 6. But it says the woman is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. She's riding this beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Boy, they get your mind just to working. Imagine perhaps a gorgeous, voluptuous woman dressed in colors of purple and scarlet. That's some kind of a deep red, isn't it? And she has this golden cup in her hand. She's a very wealthy woman. She's got all these jewels decked with gold. But she has a name on her forehead, and it's written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And John says, he says, and I saw the woman drunken. Boy, and get this. This sends chills down your back. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He wondered, who is that? What can that be? It, it, was, it was a marvel. And there was even great admiration. I, I suspect that was a begrudging admiration. And as I've always said, you know, you've got to give even the devil his due. <laughs> I mean, there, there is, unfortunately, and it's why it's so alluring. There is a seemingly beautiful side of evil. You get into it, you know, then that it's rotten, it's wormy, it's terrible. It's terrifying. But on the surface, it looks so beautiful, so much so that certainly the world admires it. And even we as Christians would say, my goodness, how incredible is that? Well, my guest today is Edward Henry. He's author of this magnificent new book that must have taken a long time to, 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 to research and write. I've talked to Edward Henry several times now. We've communicated also by email. I, I believe he really is a, a wonderful Christian man, and he cares about this subject and God has put it on his heart. The subtitle is quite interesting. It's subtitled, Tracking the Beast from the Synagogue to the Vatican. Now, what could that mean? Tracking the Beast from the Synagogue to the Vatican? Does that hold, is that the solution to this mystery, Babylon the Great? Edward Henry, quickly, he doesn't brag much about himself, but let me, I'll brag for him. I'll toot his horn a bit. He's a very successful attorney, a lawyer. He's a Christian researcher. This is one of four books he's written. He's even written one about 9-11. And I don't think we're going to have time to talk about it, maybe at a later time, his book on what really happened at 9-11. He's a sort of a hard-minded guy. I, I say that, he... he you're not going to deceive this guy. You're not going to fool him because he looks at the evidence. He's an expert on the evidence. And uh, let me also say this to you. You may be shocked when we get into this, but 
he was raised as a Catholic in Roman Catholic schools, I suppose by nuns and priests and such. And, and then he went to maybe because of their football fame and such, the most prestigious university, although it has great academic accolades um, toward it as well, the University of Notre Dame. I've been there. They didn't invite me to speak there, but <laughs> I was there just to visit there in the South Bend, Indiana. In fact, I was on a Christian television program in South Bend. Uh, University of Notre Dame, though, everybody knows that is the Catholic school in America. And then he went on to another Catholic university uh, in Detroit, Michigan, uh, University of Detroit, and got his law degree. And that is a Jesuit school. So here we have a Jesuit-trained lawyer raised as a Roman Catholic, and he's written a book, and when you find out what the subject matter is, your jaw will probably drop. Edward Henry, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Well, thank you, Tax. It's good to be here. You know, th this book, it's a huge book. its uh, I call it large format because it's about the size, just the physical size of two regular books, uh, and it's uh, 380 pages approximately, maybe a few less, 380 pages or so which would make it about 700 pages if it was a normal size book, a huge encyclopedic book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. I guess what people would really like to know is what caused you, a man of your accomplishments in the world, your education, what caused you, what compelled you to write a book like this? Well, uh, I was uh, saved a little over uh, 20 years ago. And by the grace of God, I was born again. And one of the many prayers uh, that I said and asked of God was for wisdom, that I understood that there was a, much deception in the world, and I asked him for wisdom. And uh, he has blessed me uh, with that. I take no credit for uh, really this book or any of my accomplishments. It's, it's all by virtue of uh, Jesus having chosen me uh, and saved me. Uh, and the, the reason that I wrote this book, and this goes back uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, it seemed that there wasn't much information about the Roman Catholic Church. Because once I was saved, I had a real thirst to read the Bible. And as I read the Bible, as I'm turning the pages, and on every page, I saw that, the, that what Christ preached in the Gospel is diametrically opposed to what the Roman Catholic Church has as its doctrine. And I saw that page after page, and, and my eyes were opened. And uh, it, at the time I was saved, I didn't understand that only until I read God's Word. And, but there was nothing, it, didn't, it seemed, out there as a resource for people to look to to find and compare the Bible to Roman Catholic doctrine. It just seemed that there wasn't anything out there. So I decided uh, to, to do that, to put together a, a book that compared biblical doctrine with Roman Catholic doctrine to show the error of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, in my uh, research in doing that, I, I, came, I, I wrote a, a book called Antichrist Conspiracy, which began uh, initially as, as a project to do that. However... As I started researching and looking and digging deeper into the doctrine of the Catholic Church and researching the history of the Catholic Church, um, I kept bumping into what was a grander conspiracy, a worldwide conspiracy, a, a conspiracy against man and God. And there seemed to be tentacles that were flowing from the Catholic Church to 
other organizations uh, that were the Zionist Antichrist organizations. Uh, and as I continued, and if you could think of an analogy, peeling the, the layers of the onion and going deeper and deeper, as I continued to research, uh, I, I kept bumping into uh, the influence of the Jews within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it seemed that as you went back in history, it became clearer and clearer that, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church was founded by a, a group of, uh, of uh, early Jews who inculcated uh, the Catholic Church with their Babylonian uh, religious doctrine. And that basically the Catholic Church is a Gentile front for Judaic Babylonian religion. Um, it is today uh, controlled by the Jews, primarily through their another another Gentile front, uh, the Jesuits. The Jesuits were founded uh, by Jews uh, again as a Gentile front. It became a uh, a Catholic priestly order, uh, and many have. Uh, focused on the Jesuit priesthood and some of the things that they've done throughout history because they are notorious for their conspiratorial conduct. Uh, but m what most don't understand is they are a continuation of the Jewish Illuminati. And, uh, the, you know, this Illuminati goes back to the time of Christ. Uh, and the w when Jesus talked uh, to the Jews, the Pharisees, the chief priests, and he was so critical of them, um, saying things like, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Uh, he wasn't speaking, that was not hyperbole. Uh, he was revealing to us in his word the nature of their doctrine and the nature of their conduct. And, in fact, if you read the New Testament, how they brought about the crucifixion of Christ was, again, the way they conduct themselves even today. It is, it is sort of a microcosm uh, in a few pages of, of the New Testament uh, explains clearly what is happening today. They meet in secret. They plan out what they're going to do. They then get the political elements of governments, that are uh, titularly uh, Gentile to do the dirty work. And this is, uh, the book focuses on the core of this conspiracy. Uh, and it gets right to uh, the headquarters, if you will, of Satan. Uh, there is a devil. His name is Satan. Uh, he has been defeated by Christ, but he is at war with the followers of Christ. He's in a rage. And uh, God, who is the author uh, of both the Old and New Testament, has made it clear that this uh, conspiracy is in control of the governments. If, you, if you'll notice, in um, in, in, in uh, Romans 17, uh, the great harlot is riding the beast. That is, when you ride a horse, you control that horse. When you ride any beast, you control that beast. And so this conspiracy is controlling the beast uh, that, uh, and this beast with seven heads and ten horns, it, are the heathen governments uh, of the world. It does say that there are ten kings... Uh, and that they give all of their power unto the beast. Yes. So, and, and of course, doesn't it all also say that this woman and the beast uh, dominate or control all the people, it's its kindreds and tongues, meaning languages and nations? Mm -hmm. So basically, as you said, this is a new world order conspiracy. Yeah, and the deception, you see, is is so 
uh, effective. It's as though the world is drunk, and that's the word. Those are the words that God uses. The deception is it, it's it's you know how easy it is to, to deceive somebody um, if they're intoxicated, they're out of their minds. Mm. They don't know which way to walk. They don't know how to walk straight. And this religious deception is is as though the the world is drunk. You see, mm. um, and the it's it's easy when the devil uses his spiritual methods to intoxicate the governments and the peoples of the world so that they don't see what's going on. Now, Christians who are given knowledge can see it clearly. They can cut right through it because a Christian, a born-again Christian, has the unction of the Holy Spirit. And the, that is why the war is with the Christians. Well, Ed, although Christians are the main enemy, it's not only the Christians that are going to suffer. Isn't it just the entire population of the world? That's right. That's right. Even the even the the followers, you know, within the Roman Catholic Church and within Judaism, uh, are as much victims uh, as as Christians. Uh, they are cannon fodder, really in a spiritual war uh, that has been won by Christ. Uh, the most uh, Jews and most Catholics don't really uh, understand the nature of their own religion, uh, interestingly enough. And, and I say that uh, by virtue of uh, my research and my own personal experience. They are kept in ignorance uh, to a great extent. And much has been done by both Jews and, Catholic, and the Catholic hierarchy, Jewish hierarchy, hierarchy uh, to uh, shield uh, their adherence uh, from the truth. Uh, it, uh, I can remember one time uh, when I was early on as a, uh, as a Christian, uh, I was uh, flying somewhere, I was in an airport, and uh, I had joined the uh, Gideons. And we have these uh, little uh, New Testaments that, uh, that Gideons would pass out, and I would always have uh, uh, New Testaments with me, and I would hand them out. And uh, uh, a uh, child came by, and uh, he was probably, oh, I'm guessing, uh, maybe uh, 10 years old, 11 years old. I gave him a New Testament. And uh, he, uh, was, he went back to his... Uh, father who was uh, dressed in, in an outfit that clearly identified him as an Hasidic Jew uh, with the hat and, uh, and so forth, and he was wearing black. Uh, and uh, I saw him scolding his child when his child showed him what he had received. And, uh, and I just, it was interesting that um, the, they do not allow uh, their uh, the, the Jewish hierarchy do not allow the Jews to be exposed to the New Testament. They do not want uh, any, uh, you know, uh, preaching of the gospel uh, to the Jewish adherents. Uh, they, uh, uh, they view that as a threat uh, to their religion, as does the Catholic Church. Uh, if you know the history of the Catholic Church, you know that uh, throughout their history, they have tried to prevent uh, the gospel uh, from uh, uh, reaching the, those that are within the Catholic Church. Uh, they, they will allow their Catholic catechism, uh, but even today, when you, when, when you see people going into the Catholic Church, they do not carry a copy of the Bible. They carry what is known as a missal, which is a, uh, a, a guide to the ritual that they go through during their their mass, uh, the ceremonial mass. Uh, but they uh, there is uh, and they have selected Bible readings during that mass. But that's just a front. That's uh, uh, in order to uh, deceive uh, the uh, uh, those that are in uh, the Catholic religion into thinking that they are really Christian when in fact they're not. Uh, and we can talk more specifically about that. Uh, as we uh, as we continue our discussion, uh, but the um, the key here is that you have children of the spirit, 
and then you have children of the flesh, and that's those are how the battle lines are drawn. And the children of the flesh, okay, uh, their kingdom is of this world, uh, and it's in First Timothy, uh, the Bible states that the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, again, that is not hyperbole. Uh, these children of the flesh love money. That is the source of their power. And if you look throughout uh, the, the history of the Jews and the Catholic Church, uh, but particularly the Jewish religion, uh, they, they practice uh, usury, which is charging interest on loans. And that really is the source of their power. Uh, and if, um, if you look at how it is they're able to accomplish that, it is, it is, it is so deceptive. It's almost like magic. Not one in a hundred truly understands how this economy works and why we have so many problems in the economy until it's explained to them, until, until the, the practice of usury is explained. Now, most people think they know how it's done, but they, all, they, all they understand is, oh, yeah, you have to pay a little extra on the money. Well, it's, it's actually a little deeper than that, uh, and we can get into that if, if you wish. You know, it's interesting. As I read your book, and I read it uh, twice already, <laughs> and several parts more than once, uh, uh, Ed, so I highly commend the book. But as I, I read it then, and what you're saying to us is you, you really have two great spiritual elements here, or forces. You've got the synagogue of Satan, the Jews. You've got the Vatican, which is a billion plus uh, in its fold, uh, most of them totally ignorant of what really goes on. Uh, but the papacy, the Vatican, the Jews and their synagogue of Satan, and then what you have just said binds up money, it combines the love of money with these two spiritual forces and brings it all together. So you've got spiritual or satanic power of the soul that destroys men's souls, and then you bring in the money uh, that lures people in uh, as well. Is that why the woman, the whore that rides the beast in Revelation 17, she's got all these jewels and diamonds and pearls, uh, symbols of, of money? Is that the reason that she appears to be so powerful in the, in the money department? Oh, sure. She's acquired great, great wealth. And it's, it's by the deception. Uh, they, they, she has made the world drunk through her fornication. It is uh, just a, let, let me just illustrate the point for, uh, as to what's happening in the world today, for instance. Uh, take, take, take the Federal Reserve, okay? When the Federal Reserve Act was passed, uh, it, was pre it was presented to the American people, and most people viewed it as a government-run uh, entity. When in fact, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. Most people don't understand that. They see their money, and they see Federal Reserve notes, uh, but that money is actually being uh, issued by a private corporation. And let's, let's uh, hold on just a minute. Right. Let's, let's, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. We're running out of time on this side. But hold that thought. When we come back, I want to ask you more about the Federal Reserve, money, and maybe what are its connections to the synagogue of Satan in the Vatican, okay? Okay. All right, my friend. You're listening to Edward Henry. He's my guest today. I'm Tex Mars. This is Power of Prophecy. Stay with us. We've got a lot to go uh, in tracking the beast from the synagogue to the Vatican, solving the mystery of Babylon the Great. Hello, friends. Tex Mars again. You know, I hold a book in my hand here called Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. For, well, 1,900 years plus, many people have wondered, what is the meaning of the imagery of Revelation 17? The great mother of harlots riding this beast 
with seven heads and ten horns. She has such wealth. She's got all this gold. Uh, she's decked with jewelry, gems, pearls. But she has great power, and she's actually dominating the beast at first and, I guess, telling it where to go and what to do. As far as the beast, it's a world empire. And this appears to be the beast that Daniel says is the fourth beast kingdom that comes upon the earth and devours the whole earth. I mean, we're talking about prophecy here being fulfilled. And I'm going to be asking our guest, and I think you'll find out from reading his book, that all these things are happening really right now, but we, we don't even know what's going on. But he unravels them. And so many, so much documentation, so much, so many footnotes and references. And uh, he, he takes you through the Jewish Kabbalah, the system of magic, through the Talmud, their most holy book of the Jews. What do the Jews really believe in? What is their religion all about? Did Jesus tell the truth when he told the Jews, the religious Jews, you are of your father, the devil? Is that so? Because many Christians don't believe it. Nine out of ten Christians, when I ask them the question, did Jesus ever say that the Jews' religion was of the devil? They say, well, no. That's impossible, Tex. Why, the Jews' religion is the Old Testament. What's wrong with the Old Testament? Don't say that about the Jews. God will punish you, Tex, for even criticizing the Jews. Is that true? Well, you need to discover the truth. This is the most fantastic book. You're going to find out really what the Vatican believes in. You're going to find out what the Jews really believe. And then the most amazing thing, you're going to be taken all the way back to Babylon. In fact, beyond Babylon in this book, you'll find out the Babylon connection to the synagogue of Satan, the Babylon connection to the Vatican and Roman Catholicism. And you'll find out it's one big unholy satanic mess. And this is the first book ever, the first book ever to reveal both the evil of the synagogue of Satan and the evil of the Pope, the Vatican, and the entire Vatican organization. Even the Jesuit, the Jesuit order. I can't tell you how many hundreds of letters I've gotten from people. Text, tell us about the Jesuits. Are they really as evil as some say? Well, now you have a book. You have a tremendous encyclopedic book. It will tell you what the Jesuits are up to. Are they part of the Vatican? Is there such a thing as the Black Pope? All of it in this book. Learn about the Jesuits. Discover the secrets of the synagogue of Satan. Unmask. Pull off the mask of the Pope and the Vatican. All in one great book that ultimately takes you to what else? But the word of God. The prophetic word of God. And who is this book researched and written by? Who could be more qualified than an attorney He's got an attorney's mind, successful attorney, who was inspired by God, who actually graduated and got a, a law degree from a Jesuit university. He said, wait just a minute. What's more important to me is Jesus Christ and the truth. The, see, the, the problem for Satan was that Edward Henry read God's word. When you read what God said and you compare it, to the deviltry that you were taught in these Catholic schools, ah, if the Holy Spirit draws you, then your eyes are opened. Your ignorance leaves you. You become wise, not in the rudiments of the world, the Bible says, but in the things of God. And I think that's the reason for this book. And Ed Henry, you heard his words. He said God deserves credit for this book. Now, the name on it is Edward Henry. In fact, I was very privileged to write the foreword for this book. But make no mistake, this book contains the word of God. And I'm talking about the actual words. And what Edward Henry, this attorney, this magnificent researcher does, is show you how what's going on in the world relates back to what God said and how that is tied up with the love of money, which the Bible says is the root of all evil, and the Babylonian mystery religion 
system. It's back, dear friends. It never left us. And now we have two great systems of evil, the synagogue of Satan, the Vatican that's full of evil, and they're working hand in glove. And you've never been told this before. Oh, I've talked about it a little bit. I've stressed it some, but not ever in this depth. So yes, of course, God helped Edward Henry. But I want to give Edward Henry credit. A lot of men would have shrunk away. They would have said, Lord, don't call on me. Don't ask me to write this book. There's dangers. There's risk. I, I don't want to have to put up with the with confronting the evil forces. I've got a family. I've got a career. I, I, Lord, Lord I, I can't take it. Give this job to somebody else. I'm going to ask Edward Henry why he chose to do what he did. I'm going to tell you right now, I think Edward Henry's life could be on the line. You say, well, that's being dramatic, Tex. Folks, I know what I'm talking about. There are people that are dead who have published a lot less than what is revealed in this book. Okay, now listen to me. I want you to have this book. I want you to order two copies of it. If you don't believe it is as important as I tell you, order one. Then turn around and order the second one. But do order one copy, at least of this book. I hope you'll order a copy for your pastor. He's probably mixed up. He's confused. He's a Zionist. He thinks Israel should be put on the throne. He thinks the Jews ought to be idolized. Well, he's wrong. But you need this book for evidence. Give him a copy. And dare I say this? When you go to work, when you're driving around, do you pass Catholic churches? I bet you do. I do. I, I pass right by them. A big Catholic church. You might want to buy a copy. Go in, sit down, give it to the priest. Give it to the priest secretary and say, I have a gift for the priest. Put a little note on it and say, you know, Reverend, don't call him Father. The Bible says do, don't, don't do that. But say, if you'd like to talk to me about this book, here's my phone number. You might change his life. You say, no, I doubt it, Tex. They'll scoff at me. They'll laugh at me. Listen to me. If Edward Henry was brave enough to write this book and publish it, the least you can do is tell people about it. All right? Are you not an evangelist? Did God not say in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus say, in fact, go ye in all the world? Well, one of the things we're to do, Paul said we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorant people. You can enlighten them. To use a, a word, and why should we let the other side, the evil side, have it? You can bring some illumination to the world, some light, because Jesus is the light of the world. Hey, I'm not going to let the devil have words like light, illuminate, enlighten. Those are of God. He's the darkness. But you need proof, evidence. Now you have it. So many people have asked me about this. Some of you have said, I think it's a Catholic church. Others have said, I think it's a synagogue of Satan. Whoever suspected that it would be both, that evil would be brought together. And not only that, it would be combined with the money powers of this world and the spiritual wickedness of Babylon. Wow. One book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Now, folks, it's such a huge book. And even the postage costs a lot. Here's what I want you to do. For your gift of $25 to the ministry, $25, and please add $5 shipping and handling for each copy, $30. Now, I've already told you it's twice as big as a normal book. In a bookstore, I guess this would be even more. In fact, I think the retail price of it is more than that. But we're asking you for $25 gift. Now, if you can afford it, give more than that. And we can keep this message going across the world in print on our powerofprophecy.com website and here on our worldwide radio program on WWCR, American Voice Network, and, of course, on powerofprophecy.com 24-7, seven days a week. Here's how to get your copy of this book. If you, if you want to go to the Internet, you can use your PayPal and your charge card, and that's powerofprophecy.com. Again, $30 postpaid. We have plenty of copies right now, and if not, I know Brother Edward Henry will get us printed some more, and I suspect we're going to have to have a lot more. But we have enough in right now, and uh, in fact, we just put it online, and we're all, we've already got an order or so for it, and I think we're going to get many more this coming week. 
Again, the book is about Mystery Babylon the Great. You can just say, I want the Mystery Babylon book. We'll know what you're taking about. Or I want the book by Ed Hendry. That's H-E-N, like the hen, D-R-I-E, Hendry, Edward Hendry, forward by Tex Mars. Again, $30 postpaid. Powerofprophecy.com. You can order it right now. It's right there on the home page. Just click onto it and follow directions. Or you can phone us toll free, 1-800-234-9673. That's 1-800-234-9673. And simply ask the friendly receptionist for the book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Or say, I want the Babylon, the great book. Okay, Babylon the Great Book. It's fresh out. I mean, it's we've only had it a few days here. This is a brand new book. Nice shiny cover and all. You need this book. An amazing book. You'll learn about the Kabbalah. You'll learn about the Talmud. You'll learn about the Synagogue of Satan and the Vatican and the Jesuits. All in one great package. $30 postpaid. Our address, you can order the book. By writing to us, Let's put a little note in, a little stick-it note or something, or scratch paper, or hey, you can even use nice stationery. It's up to you. And say, Tex, send me that book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. And I can promise you this, within just a couple of days, we move very fast, we'll send it to you. If it's a little slow getting to you, we'll blame the post office, because we love to get materials to you, okay? We work very hard at it. Sometimes we work late. We've worked weekends before just to serve you. That's what we do. We serve you. We're here as your ministry under the command of God. I'm an old Air Force guy. I like being under the command of God. My, my commander in chief, so to speak. But at the same time, I serve you, the soldier out in the field. Or maybe you're flying. I don't know. I was an Air Force guy, you know. Again, the book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Call us, 1-800-234-9673. That's Monday through Friday. Central Time, 8 to 5.30. Oh, the address. Jerry says, text, you forgot the address. I'm always forgetting something. I don't think it's because I'm getting old. Do you, Jerry? You don't think so? Oh, I think Jerry's just being nice. I think it is. Every once in a while, I'll have a senior moment. Our address, of course, is Power of Prophecy. Our right to text Mars. 1708-1708. Patterson Road. P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. Road. We've been here about oh, 14, 15 years. We might just stay here till Jesus comes. I don't know when that'll be but probably will. Again, Patterson Road, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733 USA. And now let's return. My guest, Edward Henry, his brand new book, outstanding book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Ed, welcome back to the program. Thank you. You know, before we go a little bit deeper into the money, situation and what the synagogue of Satan and the Vatican have to do with the money systems of this world, the Federal Reserve and so forth. I, I, I want to ask you again about your background, being raised a Catholic, going to the University of Notre Dame, and then, of course, going to a Jesuit school for your law degree. H how much stress, how much how much distress did you go through in in, in and really accepting Jesus and becoming a born-again Christian, and then leaving the Catholic faith. You're an ex-Catholic. How did that feel? What, what went through your mind and heart? Well, actually, it was the, it was the working of Christ, and it, the, the process was itself, once my eyes were, were, were open and the scales fell, and I realized what it was that the Roman Catholic Church was, I cut ties with uh, those institutions. I, uh, in, in, whereas prior to that, uh, I was an avid Notre Dame supporter. Uh, and, in fact, uh, when I was uh, attending school there, uh, we won the National Football Championship. Uh, and so it was a very exciting time to go to school there. Uh, that was the school for me, anyway, uh, as a Roman Catholic, to attend in the United States. And, uh, you, you know, the, uh, having gone there, I mean, I, I lived in Soren Hall, which is 
one of the oldest. Uh, no, in fact, I think it is the oldest dorm room in the United dorm hall in the United States with single with separate rooms. Uh, I would uh, get up in the morning and look out my window and see the Golden Dome right there. Uh, and so, uh, when reflecting on that, I view it that is all done. Uh, it, it's in my past. Uh, while uh, you know, just as John said, uh, when when he saw the woman, he wondered with great admiration. Well, as a Roman Catholic, I would look at the Golden Dome and I would look at the surroundings and I, and I wondered with great admiration. But uh, upon being saved, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, Christ put in my heart that I'm to follow him. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I've kind of put in the past. So, Well, h- how about your career? Because obviously... Uh, I mean, the Catholic Church has a lot to offer. I'm not saying you would get a job immediately with them, but, uh, you know, it's a nice, nice thing. I'm sure there are a lot of law firms that someday you might have wanted to work for or something that, you know, that are run by Catholics. The Jesuits have quite, uh, you know, a lot of people in law. Uh, so you're really sacrificing even there by cutting off uh, the papacy in the Catholic Church, weren't you? Well, it, you know, the, uh, it would only be a matter of if the firm would know what my, my stance would be. Most firms, uh, law firms anyway, um, unless they're, uh, you know, Jewish or, they, uh, or they're Roman Catholic in a very overt fashion, uh, they wouldn't really know, you know, what, what my feelings were one way or the other, unless, of course, they now, 20 years later, have, you know, with my book. So, you, in other words, if there's a huge law firm out there, uh, you don't expect to be offered a job as a partner there if the uh, if the uh, current managing partners are uh, Jesuits, right? After having written <laughs> uh, solving the mystery of Babylon the Great, if, if they knew about my book, I think that would pretty much uh, you yeah know, yeah, and that uh, yeah that that would not be likely. Well, how about your parents? It was was your dad, your mom? What did they think about your leaving the Catholic Church? Well, uh, that's interesting. They uh, they don't uh, they don't agree with it. And as much as I try to uh, reason with them, uh, they uh, they are staunch uh, Roman Catholic, uh, even to this day. So it's uh, and it's been it, it, it's been in di- been difficult. I try uh, you know I share the gospel with them. Um, I, I pray uh, with regard to them. Uh, but they are uh, they are blinded to the truth of the gospel. What if I were to tell you? Well, Ed, you probably should have stayed. I'm, I'm just being the devil's advocate, which I don't really like to do, but I will be at this time. You could have stayed with them. Look at all the good works that you could have done in the Catholic Church. I mean, and God would have really rewarded you. You might not have had to go through purgatory very uh, long because of these good works that you're going to do if you had just stayed with. The Roman Church. What would be your response? Well, that's that's like telling a, a, a gambler who has a losing hand, uh, just keep putting more money in, uh, because look at all the money you've already put in. Mm. But it's a losing hand. Oh. The the Roman Catholic Church has given people a losing hand. It is not true. They're being told that they have a winning hand. They're being told that in fact all they have to do is you know go through some purgation of their. Uh, of their sins in purgatory, uh, but it's not true. There's no such thing as purgatory. Uh, there is heaven and there is hell. There is salvation. There's damnation. There is no middle ground. And uh, you know, there's the truth, and then there's deception. Uh, the deception is very effective because of the spiritual uh, aspect of it. The unseen spiritual world uh, that is being impressed upon the Roman Catholics uh, and really the Jews to deceive them. And, and this book really is, uh, in great part, a way of reaching Roman Catholics and Jews uh, because they, there are many who have been chosen by God for salvation. I don't know who they are. Um, but just because they're Jews today or they're Roman Catholics today doesn't mean that that's what they will be tomorrow. And the 
our obligation is to spread the gospel, spread the seed. If it falls on good ground, then and it and it germinates and springs to, into salvation, then that is according to God's will. But our obligation is to see that it gets out there. Uh, it's my hope that Jews and Catholics do read this book because then their eyes will be opened. They really have been deceived by the hierarchy of their respective religions as to the deception that's going on. And it's the, the deception is, is, is very seductive because it's so powerful. I mean, they have such great, not only religious, but political power in this world. You know, and, and you made a very good point early on that Judaism is not the religion of the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's based on Babylonian traditions, and they're codified in the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Well, those traditions, okay, have been the basis for the Roman Catholic Church. And so the, the, if people viewed Judaism as the religion of the Old Testament, as what they read in the Old Testament, they would think that this book in some way was persecuting uh, the Jews. Well, in fact, it's revealing the very truths that Jesus reveals in the New Testament. Uh, and that is, it's not the religion of the Old Testament. Uh, it is a Babylonian religion. They have replaced God's laws with man's traditions, the very thing that Jesus criticized them for. And so the, their, their source of power, as I was talking about earlier, is usury. And just as when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, which, by the way, he had to do on more than one occasion, um, that's, where we are, that's what we're faced with here today. They have uh, a virtual lock on the economy, okay, because of their control of money. And as I was indicating earlier, with regard to uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve pays for the paper, and they pay for the ink, and the government printing presses print the dollars. But what happens is, when the federal government runs a deficit, by law, they must borrow the money from the Federal Reserve. Well, the interesting thing is, the Federal Reserve, okay, doesn't have money to loan the government. What happens is, the government supplies the money as soon as it borrows it. So the money comes into existence upon the government borrowing the money. And so the Federal Reserve gets enriched. Let's say, the, let's say that the federal government runs a deficit of $800 billion. Well, on the day it borrows that $800 billion, the Federal Reserve makes that, well, it's actually done by computer uh, transactions, so it's, but I'm trying to simplify it with, uh, if you can visualize it. Let's say, I, let's say I, were, I, I were the Federal Reserve, and you were the federal government, and you uh, wanted to spend $20 that you didn't have. Well, or let's make it $100. Uh, you, would, you would then come to the Federal Reserve. You would hand me the $100. I would hand it back to you, okay, and then you would be able to spend it. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like a, a proper transaction because you have to have the $100 before I, and then give it to me and I give it back to you. That's basically what's happening. The, the federal government, when it borrows money, it's actually borrowing money. It's exchanging treasury notes for federal reserve notes. It then spends the federal reserve notes. The federal reserve notes are notes that do, do not bear any interest. They are, they are a debt obligation. The Treasury notes are also debt obligations, but they bear interest. So at the end of the transaction, the Federal Reserve has a, do has a document, the Treasury note, which in fact uh, gives it the, the benefit of interest, when in fact before the transaction they had nothing. Well, why doesn't the, uh, now I'm again being the devil's advocate here, but why doesn't the government uh, just print the money on its own? Why does it need the, the Fed? If it's got to pay interest on its own money, why don't they just cut out the Fed and say, we're going to print our own money from the Treasury? They could absolutely do that. They could absolutely mm -hmm. do that. That's what Lincoln did, and uh, purportedly that's what John F. Kennedy did before he was assassinated, uh, and they could do that. 
if you look at the history, that's exactly what Lincoln did uh, during the Civil War. They wanted to charge him upwards of 20 to 30 percent interest uh, on, on loans, and he decided, no, I'm just going to print what were known as then Lincoln Greenbacks. And that worked. And it worked. Okay. Now, you can argue the constitutionality of it, but clearly the Federal Reserve is unconstitutional. In fact, I'll go one step further. Uh, I will tell you that Federal Reserve notes are actually counterfeit. It's legal counterfeit. So they passed laws to make it legal, but it's legal counterfeiting because what the Federal Reserve note is is a debt obligation. It it is a it's supposed to be an obligation. A note is a debt obligation that purports to pay the re, the, the person who ha, has that note something of value. And in the old days, it used to say pay to the bearer so many dollars of gold and so many dollars of silver. Oh yes, I remember those. I. When I was a kid, that's the only kind of bills that you had. I'd never heard of Federal Reserve notes. Yeah, well, now they've taken off the obligation. And so now what you have is you have a note that has no payment provision. And so you, it just simply says that this note uh, is, is legal tender for all debts, public and private, which means that you can give it to somebody and they re- and they can receive it but you, you get nothing of value for it if you go to the bank and say i want gold coins or i want silver coins they they will simply they they won't have anything to give you now here's a question i ask you we only got a couple of more minutes again we're gonna we're gonna have another program uh, going even deeper in all these things next week but what is the money system got to do with the synagogue of satan or the vatican how, how are all these connected uh, uh together well, the uh, first of all, if, if if you step back, the Federal Reserve is is the is run m- for the most part by foreigners, and those foreigners happen to be Zionist Jews. Okay, those are the same Zionist Jews who uh, actually uh, control uh, the Vatican. They are also the bankers for the Vatican. He who pays the piper calls the tune. These are international bankers. So it, their, their scope is international. The Federal Reserve is simply the central bank for the United States, and it is run by the, these Zionist Jews. Okay? The, the, the turmoil that we see throughout the world, uh, just think, if you could print money, in other words, th- there's nothing you could not do. Uh, and if you go back to the concept in First Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. If you had a, an unlimited source of money, you could do unlimited evil. See? And mm. these are spiritual realities. The control of the government. Remember, Mystery Babylon, okay, is riding the beast. She controls the beast, okay? And part of that control is through the monetary system. Mm. And, so that no man can that, buy or sell? Wow. I say that as back. We're going back to the revelation again. No person can buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name or the number of the beast. I'm going to ask you about that next week, uh, Ed Henry. Well, listen, Ed, we're running out of time. This program. It's been a great uh, thing to have you as my guest today. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your your boldness, your bravery, but most of all, your faithfulness to the Lord in researching and writing this great book. Thank you. All right, Ed Henry has been our guest, Edward Henry author of the brand new book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Next week, we're going to talk about the synagogue of Satan being the banker for the Vatican. Is the Vatican in the pocket of the world's Zionist money men? What's really going on behind the scenes? How is it going to affect your pocketbook, America, your family, and maybe even your life? This is Tex Mars. You've been listening to Power of Prophecy. And my prayer, my fervent prayer and wish is that you will join us each week and discover the power of prophecy.
And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. We're going to dig right into the wall and uh, create a hole and look inside. And we're going to discover the mysteries or the mystery of Babylon the Great. This is part two of our uh, two-part series. We may have to go into three or four. I don't know, Jerry, uh, because (laughs) Ed Henry is revealing a lot of things that we haven't discussed in a long time. In fact, some new things, uh, newfound things. uh, from his book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, but we're looking at the beast, the beast of prophecy and the whore of Babylon, the the mother of harlots, and we're looking at the synagogue of Satan, the Vatican, the Jesuits, the money systems of this world, and your future, dear friends. That's what we're looking at. I don't know if anything could be more important than this, and as I see it, it's going to come crashing down on us pretty soon. And then eventually Jesus will return again, but I, I'm afraid of the horrors that will come even before Christ Jesus does. Of course, he will come whenever he wants to. <laughs> Who am I to <laughs> try to stop him? I'm not. I want him to come. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the Bible says. Edward Henry's written this great book. Now, Ed Henry, let me tell you again, if you weren't with us last week, he used to be a Catholic, a very faithful Catholic, raised as a Catholic, went to Catholic schools, Went to Notre Dame University in Indiana, and I've often thought the gold dome there, and then there's a gold dome on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Maybe God gives us a clue to things, you think? Hmm, even in architecture. Well, in any case, here he was, graduate of Notre Dame. You couldn't get any more true blue Catholic than that, except you could if you went to a Jesuit law school, which he did. Successful attorney. Why would he ever leave the fold of the Catholic Church? He had the bona fides. I mean, this guy was a blue blood. But somehow he read the Bible for himself. Somehow he said something's not right. A lot's not right. And God led him out of the Catholic Church. And now God has given him this book, this ministry, to tell how many thousands of others. We don't know, but I know many thousands listen to Power of Prophecy And later on in the program, I'm going to tell you how to get this book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. I wrote the foreword for it, but it's just a beginning, because then you're going to get in the book, and you're going to find out everything about the synagogue of Satan that you didn't know before. You're going to find out what they really teach in those yeshivas, those rabbinical schools. You're going to find out what the Pope is up to, what the Jesuit order, the black Pope is up to, and it's going to amaze you. You will, you'll be shocked. This is Babylonish, and it really is. Now, I want to welcome back our guest, Edward Henry, Ed Henry, H-E-N-D-R-I-E, author uh, of this book that I believe is going to be a, a bestseller, but that's, you know, up to God. Welcome back to the program, uh, Ed. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, we could do a lot of kidding to start the program. I mean, Notre Dame, I'll never forget that year. I think it was 76, Jerry. Notre Dame, we were ranked number one in the country, the University of Texas Longhorns. Remember that we had Earl Campbell? We had to win that game, and we got beat 34-6. Uh, say there, uh, Ed, Jan- uh, I, yeah, I, 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 Ed, Jerry even remembers the date of that, <laughs> that game. <laughs> yeah, that was the Cotton Bowl. The Cotton Bowl, that's right. I went down for that game. Are you kidding me? No, I was in Dallas. It was a cold day, I remember. Oh, boy, I tell you. Well... Uh, things didn't work out right for the University of Texas, but I know one thing. I, I can see a big victory coming up for Christianity. What about you? Oh, yes. You don't think Notre Dame's going to lick uh, Jesus Christ, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I, didn't, oh, no. I didn't think oh, no. you would. Okay. <laughs> yeah. From the testimony of your book. You know, that's pretty mundane, though, talking about football. But your, your, life, your book talks about life itself, about liberty in Christ, about the beast system. This is an important book. Maybe maybe we can ask you the question, why should somebody read this book? What's so important about it? What does the subject matter tell folks? Well, it, it goes to the heart of what is really happening today. It's, um, it peels back the veil 
and reveals the man behind the curtain, uh, if you want to uh, use the analogy of the Wizard of Oz. And uh, it shows you who's really pulling the levers uh, of this world conspiracy. Uh, it's a religious conspiracy at its heart. Uh, so people want to point to certain things like the mafia uh, and other organizations as being, you know, these the, as, uh, um, as central to the world conspiracy. Uh, but in fact, it is really a theological, a, a religious conspiracy at its core. And all of these other factions are just, uh, they, they are in fact factions. If you want to view the conspiracy uh, in a visual aspect, you could think of it as like a circle. In fact, uh, one of the symbols uh, used in Satanism is a circle with a dot in the middle, signifying that Satan is at the center. And if you can think of the, the, that dot in the center as being like a pie, Okay, now when you slice a pie, you would slice it in triangular fashion, all right? But the, the devil is right at the center. And if each slice of the pie would be uh, one aspect of this world conspiracy, okay, uh, but at the, at the center is Satan. So you'll have slices coming off from that center. But what this book deals with, this book deals goes right to the heart, those, those that are surrounding, right around the devil. Now understand this, the devil's defeated, all right? Christ defeated him at the cross. He has no power over Christians in a spiritual fashion, okay? Now he has, he has influence in the world, okay? But spiritually, we're impregnable to him. And not only that, the the reason that the devil does not manifest himself physically and must work through his agents is because he is defeated. Uh, the lowliest child who is a Christian could give him commands in the name of Christ, using Christ, not her, not, not his or her own power, but using Christ uh, and his commands, and the devil would have to obey. You see, so this conspiracy is spiritual. It's concealed. By its, uh, by its very nature, it's concealed. Uh, it's concealed because it's required by uh, the devil, because he is defeated. He, cannot, he can only manifest himself to people who have established their bona fides to him, okay, that they are, in fact, lost, that they are fully in his camp, okay? But as far as m making a general revelation of, of himself to people, no. He works through his, his agents. Uh, and in fact, uh, what do we read in the, in the, uh, in the Bible about uh, uh, Judas? The devil entered Judas. Mm. See? And so we see that the devil enters people, possesses them, and he uses them to act. Uh, and he acts through people. So that, so that those like Judas who were possessed, literally possessed by the devil before he went forth and did his final betrayal of Christ. Those same devils are alive today, and maybe they're in the Pope, the highest uh, chief rabbis uh, in Rome and in and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Exactly, exactly. And and it really, it really drives home the point when Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Again, sort of giving us a an indication of the nature of the opponent he was facing. Now, Jesus, you said there, Jesus told the Pharisee Jews, which is Orthodox Judaism, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. He said, you're of your father, the devil. Now, now look, I've, I've talked to so many Christians over the years. Uh, you know, I've been so blessed in the 25 years uh, that we've had power of prophecy ministry. And pastors have said, I don't understand the Jewish thing, text. I don't understand the Zionist thing. I mean, what's the big deal? Why is that important? I mean, after all, you know, all it really is is the Jews, the rabbis, believe in the Old Testament, and we have Jesus in the New Testament. So really all we have to do is give them Jesus, and they'll be like completed Jews. And they, they, they actually believe that Judaism is Old Testament, and Christianity has just added the New Testament. But if Jesus said, you're of your father the devil... They could not have been with the, the Old Testament, right? That wasn't of the devil. That's right. The Old Testament is of, of God. That's right. So, so obviously their religion was not of the Old Testament, and, and you're saying it's not today of the Old Testament. 
So what is their religion, the religion of the Jews? If it's of the devil, what are its components? How? What have you found out in your research and study? What is? Why does the Bible talk about the synagogue of Satan if it's only the Old Testament? Okay, well, it's, it's Babylonian by source, witchcraft by nature. Okay, so it is... It is a religion of witchcraft. Mm. And as an example, uh, they have many magic talismans that the Jews use. You have the same thing in the Roman Catholic Church with their iconography. They're, it's, the same, it's the same thing, only it is the Gentile version of the Judaic magic talismans. Magic is woven all through Judaism, okay? Now, it is uh, an esoteric magic. It is not revealed to the, the general populace. Uh, it is concealed, even from most Jews. Uh, it is the hierarchy that is in tune with this witchcraft. It is the same way in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, people are, are they, they worship idols, Okay, now, the, but they, the Catholic Church has, has told them, well, we're not really worshiping idols. We look at the idol in order to give us, uh, bring to us, the, to mind, the saint that we're praying for, for instance. Well, that brings up another issue. That's the, that's the witchcraft of necromancy, of, of communicating with the dead, uh, which, by the way, uh, the rabbis do also. Uh, they engage in necromancy. So you, you, the parallelisms between what happens in the Roman Catholic Church and what happens in Judaism are striking. Uh, their doctrines are so close, and it really, when you when you look at the source for the Roman Catholic doctrines, uh, the source comes from Babylon, and it's through the Jews who brought it into the Roman Catholic Church, and in fact established the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, early on, uh, in early Christianity, the Judaizers, who were trying to draw people into their Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity, were clearly known and clearly seen as a danger. Uh, the true Christians uh, saw what, what the Judaizers were doing, saw the danger of it, wrote about it, okay, they were not deceived, okay, because as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they will not follow another. So the true sheep would not follow the Judaizers. But as you know, narrow is the way to salvation, but wide is the way to destruction. So while the few stayed away from the Judaizers, uh, and that Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity, which became Roman Catholicism, the vast majority were enticed by it. Were, uh, were you know, and and, and in, in, you know, were convinced that that was in fact the Christian Church. In fact, most Roman Catholics believe that they're Christian. If you tell them they're not a Christian, they will be uh, they would be insulted. Uh, but in fact, there's nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic Church, and nor was there anything Christian about the early Judaic Babylonian uh, uh, faction uh, that, that that became the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, again, if you go back to uh, Revelations chapter 17, what did John say about uh, mystery the, uh, Babylon the Great when he saw her? I saw her. I wondered with great admiration. And so that was his response. Well, that's the response of, of many who see the Roman Catholic Church. They have this facade of piety. Uh, but in fact, when you look at their deeds, their evil deeds, they manifest the true nature of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and their deeds truly are evil, uh, including uh, pederasty and, and all of the things that, are, that, that uh, have been in the news, uh, which is just the tip of the iceberg with regard to, you know, the, the sins of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Ed, I, I used to be in the chaplaincy, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say in a past life, you know. <laughs> I know there's only one life you live before you go into judgment. But uh, I was in the Air Force for 20 years. I was in the chaplaincy for a number of years, and I worked very close 
with a uh, Jewish chaplains. Uh, and I remember the first chaplain I worked with was an Orthodox Jew. And his office was right next door to mine. And then a little later on, a few years uh, after that, I went overseas and and uh, I worked with another uh, Jewish. Uh, I mean, we didn't have the same religious services or anything like that. We were totally separate. But we worked together, you know. At least we were office together and knew each other and so forth. Uh, and that's the way sort of the military system was. Then, then there was a, a Jew who was a, a, a rabbi who was what I call what I call. Uh, actually, he said he, he was a member of the conservative Judaism. I found it later on. Actually, we would call it liberal Jews. <laughs> you know, but they call it conservative uh, Jews. So we're f- with two different kinds of rabbis. Now, the first rabbi, uh, one time uh, we went to lunch together and we were chatting, uh, and I asked this rabbi. Uh, how much emphasis was put on the uh, Old Testament. Uh, and I was trying to sort of, you know, ask him what he knew about the prophecies that related to Jesus coming, you know, that are found in Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament. And he looked at me and he said, oh, we don't study that. We don't study the Old Testament. I said, you don't? He says, no, 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 we, we have another a set of books. And I said, what is that? He said, well, it's just another set of books. Well, you know, he, he didn't even tell me the name of it. I found it later. It was the Talmud. But he said, we study that because that, that, that is everything we need to know. That's what the rabbis, the sages, have told us. In other words, they don't study the Old Testament. And here's a man who's an Air Force chaplain. He's approved by the Orthodox Jews to come in the Air Force. That shows that he certainly uh, meets their approval and their acceptance. Uh, and he's holding worship services for Jews that are airmen. And he's telling me he didn't really study the, the Old Testament. He didn't want to talk it over with me because he, he said, really, I'm not literate in that. He's, I know that you Baptists, I was a Baptist at the time. Now I'm just a non-denominational, non-denominational Christian, just in other words, a Bible believer. But he said, I know you Baptists know the Bible better than I do, even the Old Testament. But we have our own books by our rabbi sages. And that's what we study. But he wouldn't even tell me what they were. Now, your book tells me exactly what he was studying, uh, Ed. You know what he was studying. But it's interesting that he admitted that he did not study the Old Testament, that other books were considered more important. Now, let me get to the point that I'm going to ask you this. It's said that the Pope is infallible in matters of doctrine. But he's just a man, right? Now, here we have this Orthodox Jewish rabbi saying, Tex, we don't study the word of God. We study the writings and word of men. Is there a difference between that? What, what, what's going on here? How do, you, how do you relate to what I just told you? There's clear parallelism between how the Jewish religion and Roman Catholicism. In, in Judaism, uh, their Talmud today is actually, the, those are the writings that, uh, were the oral traditions at the time of Christ. Uh, and so the very thing that Christ criticized them for, uh, following their traditions, in place of God's laws, okay, they've later codified into several volumes called the Talmud. Okay, uh, there's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Tal- Talmud is the more authoritative of the two. Uh, and that is that is what they follow. The Talmud, uh, if you read it, and there's a fantastic website called Come In Here, which has about 90% of the Talmud uh, online, and people can read it. It's been translated into English. Well, you have a lot of it in your book. You have all kinds of uh, quotes I went, right I went, from the Talmud. I went through a good portion of it and picked out the, those things which were notable and were important for people to know. Mm-hmm. For instance, uh, the Antichrist nature of the Talmud. Uh, the Talmud, in fact, all of Judaism, is really a religion whose focus uh, is on Christ, but it, the, it's on the hatred of Christ and the hatred of Christians. And I don't, I don't want to overstate it, and I, I explain with authority in, in the book Point by point. For instance, let me just give you an example. Uh, in the Talmud, uh, they describe Jesus as right now being in torments, torments in boiling hot semen. 
uh, that is how they describe, they blasphemously describe Jesus Christ. Uh, their Passover ceremony is, has become a ceremony where they attack Christ and Christians, and it is turned into basically a, a ceremony, uh, an antichrist ceremony. So the Jewish religion uh, is really so, the one thing all Jews agree on, no matter what else they disagree about, the one thing they all agree on is that Jesus is not the Messiah. They all are against Christ. They reject Christ, whether it's an um, uh, Orthodox Jew uh, or whether the, the person is a Reformed Jew, uh, even, the, even though Orthodox and Reformed Jews are really, uh, there's quite a controversy between them. In fact, Orthodox Jews don't even consider Reformed Jews true Jews. But the one thing that they both agree on is that Christ Jesus is not the Messiah. And that, that view of using their traditions to set aside God's laws and as codified in their Talmud, is found in the Roman Catholic Church as well. The Roman Catholic Church considers the magisterium of the Church to be the final authority. And that magisterium is made up of the doctrines of the Church added to the Bible. Now, what happens is, while they say that, what in fact happens is, it's their doctrines which supplant the doctrines of the Bible. So they say they've added, but they have actually over, uh, uh, supplanted uh, those provisions of the Bible which are the Gospel. And they've created their own religion, which parallels very closely the Babylonian religion. So the same, and the, 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 the infallibility of the Pope is derived from Judaism. Now, uh, you know, you mentioned in your book and you, you prove, of course, and document that the Catholic Church in its catechism, its new catechism, actually tells Catholics that in terms of a doctrine and faith, the final authority is the Church rather than the Bible. Isn't that true? That's true. I mean, they really, they, they really blast fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians, and they say that the era that people like Edward Henry and Tex Mars would make then is that we have the Bible as our source, and they have the Pope. Well, and, and when, you talk, when you talk to a Catholic about what the Bible says, because they are kept in ignorance about what the Bible says, their retort usually is, well, that's your interpretation. Mm. See, and that's how you interpret it. But we have this long history, this church, which has read the Bible, and all their experts have said, this is what it really means, and so we're going to go by what the, what the Roman Catholic hierarchy has decided it means. So we don't have uh, uh, an interpretation, they, they say, by a man who's read the Bible. We have an interpretation that's officially stamped by the Pope. When he speaks ex cathedra, it is infallible, and therefore, without error, and irreversible, irreformable, it is, it is the true doctrine, okay? And if you say something contrary, then you are against the Pope. The Pope has deemed to be infallible. You are not. You're wrong. And that, that's, how they've been, that's how they've been conditioned. Well, now the, it's hard the, to the found that. The rabbi that uh, I worked with, uh, now that I look back on it, he would probably say... Uh, my beliefs are based on what Rabbi uh, Maimonides said uh, back, you know, hundreds of years ago, or my beliefs are based on Rabbi Ben Eleazar, what he said. So they rely on uh, rabbis who are dead, and Catholics rely on popes, I guess, that are dead and, and still alive, right? Yes. Yes. It's a, it's but either way, it's a... a parallelism. Uh, you know, when Jesus said then that uh, to the Jews, he told them, you have for your religion the, the commandments and traditions of men, he really meant it. Yes. Well, I mean, you, you, you can look at, uh, for instance, the Mariolatry of the Roman Catholic Church comes directly from Judaism. 
Wow. Uh, the queen now, of hold on, wait, wait, hold on just a minute. Now, the, yeah, that cannot be because the Jews say we worship one God. He's a father God. And you Christians worship three gods, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They don't really understand, you know, what First John says about the three or one. But in any case, they would say, and the Catholics worship Mary, but we worship only a male, masculine God. But what really is the truth? Well, they actually worship the Queen of Heaven. And uh, and it's spoken of, their worship of the Queen of Heaven is, is spoken of and criticized by, uh, by God in the Old Testament. And that, and that queen of heaven... We're talking about Jews. Now, Jews actually worship right. a queen of heaven. That's right. Okay. That's right. They, wow. they worship the queen of heaven, uh, and they, they as today, they uh, and, and, and in history, they have done the same thing. It's a polytheistic religion. They, it is not a, uh, a, a religion with, with only one, uh, one god. They have, uh, uh, they have many gods and goddesses, in their religion, and and my book explains that, uh, describes them, and uh, and cites their the, their own authority for it. That's a shock. A lot of this, a lot of this is esoteric knowledge, which is concealed, okay, from the ordinary Jews. The hierarchy knows about this, okay, in Judaism, but for the most part, uh, the the common Jews are kept in ignorance of this. So this is sort of like Ezekiel, in uh, chapter 8 of, of the book of Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel was told to dig in the walls and see what you see. And then God showed him, in, in a vision, he shows him what was behind the wall. And there were the elders of Zion, the chief rabbis, in other words, and they were worshiping all these other gods and goddesses and astrological symbols and that were painted yeah. around the walls. And the, the common average Jew didn't even know what was going on, right? That's right. And that's still going on today to a great extent. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, Israel Shahak, who, whom I quote in the uh, uh, in my book, uh, you know, he said, uh, "Whatever can be said about the Kabbalistic system, it cannot be regarded as monotheistic, unless one is also prepared to regard Hinduism, the late Greco-Roman religion, or even the religion of ancient Egypt as monotheistic." Mm. Okay. And basically, what Israel Shahak is saying is, this is a polytheistic religion, and uh, it, you know they they actually offer prayers to many different gods, including Satan. He <laughs> states that uh, both before and after a meal, a pious Jew richly washes his hands, uttering a special blessing. Uh, on one of these two occasions, he is worshiping God by promoting the divine union of son and daughter, and, we'll, and that's talked about in another portion of my book. Uh, but on the other, he is worshiping Satan. Now, this is what is explained by Israel Shahak. Uh, now, uh, is, who, who was Israel Shahak, and why should he? We... He's a Jewish scholar, mm -hmm. uh, and he's revealed many things about Judaism uh, in his writings. Okay, I think he was a professor I, at Hebrew University, in fact, in Jerusalem. That's correct. Yeah, okay. So, the uh, and again... The, the authority for what I say is found in the, the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the Jewish authorities themselves. And so really uh, it's hard for them to refute uh, what is said in the book because it comes from them. Well, probably what would happen, they, they're not going to debate you. They know you know. If a, if a rabbi, a chief rabbi, were to read your book, he would just shut up and call you a liar and every name in the book. But never would he want to debate you on the evidence, and I'm very positive of that. Well, Ed, we're going to have to go for a little break here. I'm going to tell folks how they can get your book, how they can order it. You must have this book. This is Tex Mars. You're listening to Power Prophecy. Don't go away. We've got another full half hour, and we're going to talk about Satan, his synagogue, and his Vatican when we return in just a moment. Texmore is back again. Dear friends, I want to recommend this book to you, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Now, it's a big book. It's a large format, uh, around 376 pages, you know, moving toward 400, I guess you could say, but it's, it's a large format. 
looks like a phone book of a major city. It's so big. A little bit sort of like my big books, you know, Mysterious Monuments, Codex, Conspiracy World. It's the first book I know of that tracks the beast all the way from the synagogue to the Vatican. And so many of you have written me wanting to know. You've asked me, text, who is the mother of harlots? Who is the whore of Babylon? Who is the beast of prophecy? And now I believe Edward Henry has answered this question. And it's a shocking answer. But you know, it all makes sense. When you realize the devil is going to, I mean, he's putting it all together. You know, back when I was in the Air Force, the Air Force worked very close with the ground forces, the Army, the Marines, the Navy. So we would be a unified team. Now the devil has got his unified team together too. The synagogue is working with the Vatican in these last days. He's putting his best forces of evil together, a combination of evil. And Edward Henry shows how all of this can be tracked back to Babylon. So again, the Bible is proven correct in its prophecies. This is a fantastic book. And you've got to have it, folks. I, I hope you'll buy extra copies. Bring it by a synagogue and give to the, you know, he might not see you personally, but leave it to a secretary. Leave a copy of this book. Bring it to the Catholic churches in your area. Be an evangelist. Okay, they may get angry at you. They may demand you come back and pick it up. Uh, and maybe you don't even want to tell them your name. Uh, but, you know, just leave the book off for them. I think your pastor needs a copy. I can promise you most pastors have never heard these things. They need to know what is in the Jewish Talmud. What does the Jewish Kabbalah say? Do the Jews and the Vatican alike worship a queen of heaven? Are the doctrines and dogma of the Jews similar, almost parallel with that of the Vatican? The similarities, is it true? And you'll read in this book, I mean, the Pope is actually working with rabbis now. I mean, it used to be that people thought, boy, the Pope is really fighting the Jews. The Pope is really a, an opponent of the Jews. But Ed Henry shows that that's all just been a fake, sort of the Hegelian dialectic. They're actually working together. And now they've opened the door and you can peer in and see what's going on. They make no pretense of being enemies anymore. They are allies in the war against the Christian church, against humanity itself. You'll want this book, Babylon the Great, Solving the Mystery of. Now, here's how to get it. We need to move very quickly, folks, because I want to get back to my guest, Ed Henry, the author of this book. And I have been so privileged to have written the foreword uh, for it, for this book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, $25, $25. Remember, it's the size of at least two, three regular size books, full of information. It's not going to be a book you can read in one hour, I promise you that. Full of documentation. You'll know a lot of what the Talmud has to say, the Kabbalah has to say. You'll know more than many Jews know, and most Catholics as well, after you've read this book. And I'll tell you something, you'll find that pastors don't know anything about this. Oh, I know, I've got the curriculum of the uh, of Dallas uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, you know, Southwestern Theological Seminary and uh, DTM up there. And I'll tell you, they don't study this. I wish they would. They need this as a textbook. But they're, they're, they're in bed now with the Catholic Church and these Baptist schools. No wonder they won't even believe the truth anymore. You know, Jerry Falwell was on the podium when, when Pope John Paul II visited America. And I asked, I had the occasion to ask Jerry Falwell about that. He phoned me, he wrote me a letter, and uh, I, I asked him to explain that. Well, what could he say other than he wanted to cooperate to help issues like abortion or whatever? Well, he gave up the faith to fight abortion. That's, he said, that's why I'm joining forces with the Catholic Church. That's why I stood on the platform with the Pope when he came to America. I wonder if it's okay to work with evildoers for a good cause. I don't think so. Jerry Falwell believed it. Well, I think he's got the answers now from God. 
And you'll have all the answers you need in this book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Now, I've said, I've talked so much about the book, I'm just telling you how important it is. I've read it twice already, and I'm going to read it again, because there's so much information uh, in this. And Ed told me he, he spent 10 years working on the book. Now, here's how to get it. $25, add $5 shipping and handling, $30 total, postpaid. We'll get the book right out to you. You won't be waiting six weeks. We've got plenty of copies right now. So bear with us, but I'm telling you, we'll get it right out to you. And we'll send it out in a nice package. And um, the book, again, has a lovely a cover. Boy, just reading the table of contents sends chills up my back. $30 postpaid. You can go online and get the book at powerofprophecy.com. Use your PayPal or charge card. You can phone us and use your charge card too. Visa, MasterCard, or Discover. Phone us toll free, in fact. No charge. 1-800-234-9673. When you order this book, I'm going to give you a free subscription to my newsletter, Power of Prophecy. And watch online. Uh, we'll have an article. In fact, it should be there now. You'll want to go uh, and read that article. Now, those of you who've been getting my newsletter, you know the feature article of the newsletter that you've just received in the mail is Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. But you'll want the book itself. $30 postpaid. You can order it by phoning us toll free 1-800-234-9673 in the United States and Canada. If you're from Mexico, Romania, the Soviet Union, well, it used to be the Soviet Union, Russia may be there, uh, so Union again, the way things are going with Putin and Medvedev. But uh, in Russia, in uh, Great Britain, Australia, all of our friends, we've got so many in Britain, Australia, and New Zealand, particularly South Africa, so many friends wake up in the middle of the night and listen to this program. They really do. They say, I can't wait till it's online. You know, I need to get it. They wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning or something uh, in, in Johannesburg in South Africa to listen to this program, and God bless them for that. To order the book, of course, you can phone us on our toll line if you're overseas, and that number is area code 512-263-9780. Our address, send $30 cash, check, money order, cashier's check, to Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas. Our zip code, 78733. Now let's return to our program. We have Edward Henry on the line with us from the great state of Virginia. A patriotic state, in fact. Edward Henry is a graduate of Notre Dame University, a Jesuit university, uh, University of Detroit. But uh, he's no longer a Catholic. He's just a Christian. I say just. Praise God uh, that he is a, a Christian, a believer uh, and a great authority on this topic, having studied the Kabbalah, the Talmud, and the, the Catholic uh, doctrines, and putting it all together uh, in this book for you. Ed Henry, welcome back to Power of Prophecy. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, let me just tell you what happened recently. I was, re I was online, and I read an article by a man who used to be a Methodist, and he's a very educated person. He wrote a very articulate article. He said he wanted to know what Judaism was all about. So, unfortunately, he doesn't know anything about the Talmud of the Kabbalah like you do. Hasn't read your book. Your book, in fact, just came out. But he says online that he wanted to visit a Judaic church, synagogue, and so he did. He said, I was raised Methodist, you know, to believe in social justice and, you know, the gospel of helping the poor and all those things. So let's just say he was a liberal in terms of politics and so forth a Methodist. And he said, I visited a synagogue, and to my surprise, he said, I love the service. I love the, they did the Jewish dancing and the music. I loved all of the symbols that they had displayed and so forth. I just loved everything going on in this worship service, in this synagogue. And he says, then the rabbi got up, and he had on his talit, you know, and his, his shawl and all this, and, and his um, robes and whatever, and his uh, Yarmulka cap, skull cap. And he said, but what impressed me was the sermon. He said the rabbi got up and praised President Barack Obama. And he, he said that President Barack Obama wants to help the poor with his Obama Medicare program. 
And he says, now the conservatives, the Republicans and so forth are fighting it. But we Jews favor Obama Medicare program because we we care. And, and these Republicans, he said, you know, I, that are these Christian uh, conservatives, they are against this. But, you know, we Jews want this program. He said, now, to do a good work, you will support, as a Jew, the Medicare program of Obama and the, and the Democrats. And he said, so you write your congressmen, your senators and so forth, you phone them and let them know, as a Jew, you support this. And God will give you credit. It'll be a mitzvah. That means a good work. And in the world to come, you know, you'll get credit for having performed this good work that the Jews call a mitzvah. And this former Methodist said he was so impressed. He said that just, he said, I actually wanted to cry. That touched my heart so much to, to, to realize that it would be a good work and, and that I would receive credits in the world to come that I decided to convert to Judaism right then and there. And he said, and now I'm on my way. He said, I'm going twice a week instructions in the synagogue. And the rabbi sits down with me and shows me the, the beauty of the Judaic religion. And soon I'll be a full-fledged convert uh, to Judaism. I'll be just like all the other Jews, even though I was not born a Jew. Finally, thank God, I can become a full Jew. And it was all because I believe in Obama Medicare. And I realize how wonderful Judaism is. Now, I, literally, this is the message. This is what this former Methodist had to say. In light of all of your research, what would your response be in reading this report? It, this is a truthful story, by the way. Well, uh, my conclusion is he's been made drunk with the cup of the fornication of Babylon the Great. Let me just uh, uh, say this. One thing that people have to understand, in particular, and now that you've mentioned the Obama medical care plan, government is one thing and one thing only. It is force. Uh, it is not eloquence. It is not reason. It is force. Now, those aren't, those aren't my words. Those are the words of George Washington. He, in my view, is one of the foremost experts on what is government. He likened government to a fire. It is a fearful master and a troublesome servant. Again, those aren't my words. Those are the words of George Washington. And the reason that they framed our government the way they did was because they did not trust people. And they were concerned that government, when it gets out of control, can be destructive. Fire can be used for very good things. You can cook your food, you can heat your house, but if it gets out of control, the results can be disastrous. And that's the same with government. When, you, when you're talking about government, okay, if somebody can control that government, that is control the force of government, then they can bring tyranny. Now, what many, I would say, the vast majority of people do not understand is that communism is Judaism. In other words, the Bolshevik Revolution, which is now worldwide communism, okay, is the plan of the Jewish hierarchy, the elders of Zion. And when we're talking about using government force, and you read the book of Revelations, and you see that Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is riding the beast. She's controlling the beast of government. Okay? This is the philosophy of that religion. It's come, it, it, if you want to know what Judaism is about, all you need to do is communist governments. Okay? They, that is a Judaic philosophy okay, that controls governments. When you look at, at the governments, in particular with regard to the, the, the health care plan, now stop and think about this. This health care plan requires a person to buy something that they ordinarily would not want to buy. The government is forcing somebody to purchase health insurance. 
it would be like the government issuing an edict. Well, we have we have a lot of wheat on the market. We're going to issue an edict. You must buy two loaves of bread today. It's so beyond the pale of the proper authority of government uh, that several courts in the United States so far have ruled it unconstitutional. And the reason that they require that people buy health insurance is because the government has done something else that is now unconstitutional in that health plan. They require an insurance company to insure somebody for a pre-existing condition. Well, they know that if insurance companies are required to insure somebody if they have a pre-existing condition, nobody is going to buy any health insurance until such time as they need it. It's like somebody crashing their car, calling the insurance company and saying, hey, I just crashed my car. I'd like to buy insurance and get it fixed. So the person breaks his leg. Hey, I just broke my leg. I'd like to get some insurance so I can have the, you pay for it, insurance company. Okay. It, what the government did was, in order to prevent the people from doing that, it's forcing everybody to buy insurance under this plan so that people will not do what the insurance companies know people will, in fact, do if they're required to insure people for pre-existing condition. And so that's the silliness of this medical plan. And the reason it's being foisted upon the citizens is because the government is going bankrupt, and it needs more tax revenue. And that's why they're doing this. They're not doing this to help people. They're doing this to take away our liberty, okay, force us to buy something that we don't want. That men, I shouldn't say we. I should say that some people don't want. People should have a, the freedom to choose whether they want insurance or not. But that's what's behind this. The government is, is uh, they, they have to take money out of circulation. They've inflated the currency to such a great extent. We're on the precipice of, of the collapse of the government, and this is a, this is a desperate effort to, to raise revenue, which they don't really have. Now, in Israel, all of the hospitals are owned and run by the government, and in fact, all of the hospitals in Israel require the hospital to provide free abortions to women. You know, I have a, a, a ministry that I know of that uh, gives uh, has given many uh, thousands of dollars in, in gifts to a hospital in Israel. And I discovered that that very hospital uh, performs free abortions on Jewish women and even uh, advertises them. And uh, I asked the, uh, the head of the ministry about that, and he got very angry at me. He says, don't you realize, Tex, we're helping the Jews by supporting one of their hospitals. And I said, but they have socialized Medicare. They are like communists. They have socialized Medicare. They, they don't need your money. It's just extra icing to help them do abortions and such. And he got very mad. He said, don't you realize in helping Israel, we're doing God's work and God will bless us? Isn't that a little bit what the rabbi said? In helping the medical plan of Obama, you're doing God's work, a mitzvah, and God will help you in the next life to come or the next world to come. When the Jews, of course, have their kingdom, and their Messiah, not Jesus, rules over all of mankind, you'll be rewarded. And this former Methodist bought into it. Yeah. Do, do you think he really knows? He, he admitted he knew nothing. He said, I knew nothing about Judaism. But I, he was so inspired by that one service and what he had heard from the rabbi that he gave his whole life over to the, the Jewish religion, Judaism. Does that amaze you at all? Uh, it's really sad. It's really sad, and um, I'm I'm not surprised mm. uh, because I know of other instances where that same type of thing has happened. So, but it's it's a it's it's really a sad occurrence. Now, well, wait, let's but, get but, back. What, 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 yeah, what go ahead. listeners have to understand is that in, in Israel, that is a pure communist country. The kibbutz, if you talk to any uh, any Jew who's been to Israel, the kibbutzim is pure communism in its purest form. And so the we've been deceived into thinking that this is the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, uh, how are you going to characterize democracy? We can get into a political discussion, but we have a constitutional republic here in the United States. It's constitutionally a limited republic. Uh, democracies 
uh, are not necessarily the best form of government if it is not if it does not have limits to protect the minority. You see, a, a pure democracy, if you want to think of it this way, is a lynch mob. The majority has decided somebody's guilty; they're going to lynch them. Okay, and if you're in the minority, that is the one with the noose around your neck. You're not going to think democracy is such a great thing. You'd like to have some laws there to protect you. And the idea is we are not a country of persons, but uh, a country of laws, if that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, but with communism, uh, the protections that are, uh, are given are, re- are, are, now, are now removed because our rights do not flow from the Constitution. They flow from God. That was understood by our founding fathers. We are endowed with uh, uh, inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. Jefferson used the, used the term pursuit of happiness, but the, properly it's property. In any event, uh, those are God-given rights. Well, communists is an atheistic form of government. They don't accept that a person has God-given rights. So the government in a communist country can do whatever it wants. And Israel is basically, a, then Israel is being a, 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 an extreme form of socialism. Now, in the communist system, they chose classes. So one class was superior to another class. And if you remember the communist party, you know, you might be given a very fancy uh, DACA, you know, apartment to live in or even a beautiful uh, mansion home uh, on the coast. But if you were not a member of the, uh, of the communist party, you might have to live three families in one apartment uh, you know, just really live uh, in a, a shambles or in a slum area. And, of course, if you were a Christian in the Soviet Union, you might end up living in a gulag. Now, in Israel today, is it not true that if you're a Christian, you will they will not even allow you to own land, only if you're a Jew? So they actually distinguish between religions. If you're a Muslim or a Christian, you cannot even own a piece of property. That doesn't seem to be democratic uh, to me in the in the terms that we think of democracy. What do you what do you uh, think about that? No, you're you're absolutely correct. And in that system, uh, whereas in in our system of government, we have individual liberties, individual rights. In their system of government, it is group rights. Your rights are determined by your membership in a group. Ah. And the Jews and the Jews have the upper hand, so they are favored in all areas of, of, of culture and life. Exactly, exactly. And uh, what they do over there, uh, a a Jew, okay, is has greater rights in Israel than anyone else, okay. And uh, the what they do there could never be done here in the United States because it's it's a uh, it's prejudicial discrimination, where a group of people, by virtue of their religion, has certain benefits that others do not have. They get scholarships, they have uh, rights to land, they have all sorts of immigration rights that others do not have. Uh, and there is no, they, 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 um, they avoid this idea of an Israeli citizenship. Okay, because a an Arab who's lived there for a long time could be an Israeli citizen, but they are not given the same authority, the same rights as a Jew who lives there, even though he may, the the Arab has been living there for uh, decades. A newly arriving Jew would have greater rights than that Arab. It's a uh, it's a discriminatory uh, based on on on. Uh, depending on, on your view, whether it's race or whether it's uh, religion. Uh, in my opinion, it's a religion, uh, and based on religion, they're given certain rights. Okay, and let's, let's talk. You know, we only have about four minutes left here, and I think it's so important. The prophetic implications. In your book, you show that the synagogue of Satan, Judaism, and world Jewry, uh, for the most part, and the Vatican, the Pope, his curia, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, Empire, you might say. They're working together for a certain purpose, and it's all going to cascade down. It's, it's moving very fast toward the end of the world. 
is that the prophetic implications? And this, is this a threat to every American, to our way of life, you might say? And, and really, is, is this going to involve eventually, according to the Bible, this coming together of the synagogue and the Vatican, a church, uh, is it going to come together as the great beast system that's prophesied and meaning uh, uh, martyrdom, death, uh, bloodshed, and a world economic and, and political system? Uh, yes, I think so. But what I think is important for people to understand is that the response of a Christian, while we, we don't want to uh, sweep under the rug the the evil of these religious systems. Uh, by the same token, we, our response should be spiritual, uh, putting on the whole armor of God, preaching the gospel, uh, acting in love towards Jews and Roman Catholics, mm. uh, so that we don't fight this conspiracy using carnal methods. We use spiritual methods. What did Jesus do? He rebuked them for what they did, okay, but he also spread the gospel. He preached to them. He showed them the way to salvation. You see, the gospel is the way to defeat what is happening. Not carnal methods. They have, uh, the Nazis found that that does not work, and it will not work. It plays into their hands. Anti-Semitism is actually a tool used by Zionists to keep their people in control. It is used by them. And so the, uh, anything that, is, that is, would be considered uh, anti-Semitism, okay, that is actual anti-Semitism, is, is usually a, uh, uh, controlled by the Jews in order to keep them uh, uh, in control. So it feeds and it, actually fuels it. You're actually helping the devil by, by being a hater, if you were a hater. That's right, that's right. Uh, the devil uses hate, he mm. uses subjugation, whereas Christians use love and obedience uh, to God's word. And so the, uh, while there's competition within Satan's kingdom, whereas one head is gnawing at the other, uh, and while they're both going in the same direction, there is going to be conflict within Satan's uh, hierarchy. But the Christian response okay, should be one of love, both towards the Jews and to the Roman Catholics. Well, you know, you used to be a Catholic of yourself. Of is Ed. <laughs> them. Yes. You know, you were once a, a Roman Catholic yourself. I, I mean, a premier a Roman Catholic with all your credentials and a college uh, a degrees and so forth. Uh, and, you know, imagine if we had hated you. Imagine if we'd have said, let's go out and kill Ed Hendry. You could have never been able to write this book. You would have never known the love of Jesus in your life. You know, Ed, I want to thank you so much for having the courage to come on here. The bravery, again, the boldness to write this book. I know you're serving Jesus, and you couldn't help yourself, but uh, I want to thank you for being a, a Christian hero that followed the call of the Lord. And I want you to come back again later on to tell us more. Uh, about this subject, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Folks, you've got to have this book. Ed Hendry, thank you so much. Thank you, Tex. Okay, Ed Hendry, lawyer, author of four books, and my goodness gracious, what a tremendous prophetic book, exploring, doing more than exploring, getting into the crux of the synagogue of Satan, the beast of prophecy, and the Vatican itself. We've We've opened up the, the secret safe, the, the inner sanctum, and we've looked inside, but you need this book to fully understand and expose the devil and his works. My prayer, dear friends, is you'll tune in each week during the same time. Tune in and discover the power of prophecy.
And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, if there's one thing for sure, the Bible says it's prophecy. There's a sure word of prophecy that, you know, the uh, the apostles uh, talks about. And, of course, the book of Revelation says that Jesus himself is the spirit of prophecy. Must be very important, don't you think? So we're going to talk about that today. In fact, I'm going to talk uh, with a, a gentleman here who has written a power-packed book. I think he's done so because he, he first started with the scriptures and said, you know, uh, to God in his own way, in his prayers and in his uh, concerns and thoughts, Lord, help me solve the riddle, the mystery of one of the more important features of the book of Revelation, which is Revelation, well, it's really several paragraphs, but particularly Revelation 17, the mystery of Babylon the Great. Now, you may say, well, what has that got to do with me? I mean, <laughs> the ancient Babylonian empire is long gone, but you would be wrong. I'm going to ask uh, Ed Hendry, my guest today, about that. A lot of people think that, well, Babylon's gone. That's where they had the Tower of Babel and so forth, and God confounded their languages. Well, we know all about that story, and I'm not discounting the importance of, of that biblical instructive story. But it's interesting that God says this Babylon the Great would be restored and you might say an even greater vainglory. Now I say vainglory because that's sort of the opposite of true glory, which is the glory and majesty of God. In any case, Ed Hendry, Edward Hendry, has written an excellent book on the subject. It's a big book. It's a encyclopedic type book. It's sort of like I like to say about mine, about the size of a telephone book, you know. And it's got, oh, not quiet, maybe 375 or more pages in it, including the footnotes and references and such. Its title, and I'm going to give you both the title and the subtitle, I think it's very descriptive of the subject matter, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. And the subtitle is Tracking the Beast, now get this, Tracking the Beast from the Synagogue to the Vatican. Synagogue, Vatican, Babylon the Great, is there a connection? Well, I think you're going to find out that there is. Ed Henry, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Thank you, Tex. It's good to be here. You know, I, I really should give people your bio. I know it, I'm very familiar with it, but I want to mention to the folks out there that you are an attorney and a great one at that. You, you've had many uh, journal articles, you know, scholarly, lawyerly, I guess you could call it, uh, articles uh, published in journals, uh, and then you've been a legal uh, instructor, sort of a, a professor, you might say, of the Bill of Rights, and uh, also you're a graduate, and I think this is quite interesting, uh, of a, uh, and you have a JD degree, I think it is, a law degree, uh, and your graduate, uh, though, the bachelor's uh, is from the Notre Dame University, very prestigious Catholic school, but you're a born-again Christian. You came out of Catholicism into the light of Jesus Christ. Is that right? That's right. I grew up a Roman Catholic. I went to uh, Catholic grade school, uh, Catholic high school. Uh, I also went to Catholic public school. Um, I then uh, uh, went to a, uh, a public university, transferred to Notre Dame, graduated from Notre Dame, and then I went to a, a Jesuit uh, law school, University of Detroit, where I received my law degree. It it was after that uh, that the Lord saved me. And as soon as I started reading God's Word, it became clear to me that Roman Catholicism, Catholicism was the very antithesis of biblical Christianity. And as I began to study and research the conspiracy that quite apparent uh, that exists worldwide against uh, Christ and against uh, Christians. I saw at the fulcrum, at the center of this conspiracy, uh, was the Roman Catholic Church. 
as I began to examine uh, their involvement in this conspiracy, I kept seeing indications of Jewish influence. And at first, uh, I thought it was just a coincidental sort of allegiance of the two interests in certain areas. But as I began to dig deeper, it wasn't simply an alliance. I determined uh, from my research that, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church is truly a mystery because it is a uh, Judaic Babylonian religion that is cloaked in Christian garb. And so it portrays itself as a Christian religion, but it's anything but that. It is, in fact, a Babylonian religion. It appears Christian, hence the mystery, but in fact it's Babylonian. And it's the very Babylonian nature uh, of that religion that Christ was critical of the Pharisees and the Sadducees for, because what they had done is they had taken God's Word and shoved it to the side and replaced it with their traditions. And those traditions came right out of Babylon. Uh, and today those traditions are manifested in the, the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Back then, the traditions were simply oral traditions, and Jesus was very critical of them. Well, after the crucifixion of Christ, the, the Jews saw that there was this Christian movement, and they tried to infiltrate it, and that was impossible, that is impossible. The true Christian church cannot be infiltrated by the enemies of Christ, because Christians have an unction of the Holy Spirit, and so pure Christianity does exist. But what they were able to do, because most of the world, as the Bible says, is unsaved, they were able to construct a false church, a false Christianity that appeared to the world to be a Christian church, but in fact is Babylonian entirely. It's, it's witchcraft. It is the antithesis of what Jesus taught. And the book, okay, examines that and goes through and, 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 and explains the evidence of the Jewish and Babylonian origins of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, I'll tell you, the, the book does a great job, your book, uh, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, because over and over again, what you, what you do here is you compare the doctrines, the practices, the traditions of the Jewish religion, the same one that Jesus confronted, although I think it's even darker today with the you know add-ons and the viciousness of it in their communal uh, efforts to, to push it. Uh, but, but you really compare... As you mentioned, the Jewish Kabbalah, the Jewish Talmud, uh, and their traditions, the manly tr man-made traditions, with those of Rome. And you know, there's the same problems as you're talking about. The Roman Church, very specifically in its catechism, uh, says that uh, although they claim the Bible, they go beyond that. In fact, they say the Bible is not enough. They need the traditions of the of the Church. And the Jews, of course, say the the Torah and the Old Testament is not enough. They need the traditions of the rabbis in the synagogue. And then you show where those traditions of the elders, so-called, are the same, both for Judaism and the Catholic Church. It comes down, I mean, from, for everything from their, you know, communion to their works-based salvation plan, so-called. Everything matches up. And, and isn't it interesting, though, Ed? Uh, I hope you don't mind me calling you Ed rather than Edward. Uh, Absolutely. That's uh, fine. Okay. Uh, isn't it interesting that the Bible, you know, talks about the synagogue of Satan, but Christian churches until this century, and now, of course, they've dropped all pretense. They don't even hardly believe in the prophecy anymore in, in Christian churches. But, but uh, back when I was a kid and maybe even when you were a child, I think I'm a few years older, quite a few actually, but in any case, a, a lot of churches still did, you know, the real 
traditional Christian churches that still believed in the Bible back 40 or 50 years ago, they actually still said that the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, was the whore of Babylon, Babylon the Great. Uh, and nobody, of course, talked about Israel or the Jews uh, at all back then very much. Uh, that sort has been thrown by the wayside, and you have just some people out there, very small minority, who still talk about the Catholic Church. But these people have never studied Judaism, and they really don't know or understand the connection between Judaism and the Catholic Church. But you connect it, you trace it all the way back, uh, really, to the days of Jesus, don't you? Yes. Yes, and the, it... it uh that they started right then. Satan, this is this is a, this is spiritual warfare, and and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities and powers, against the rules of darkness uh, of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the the head of this conspiracy is Satan, and so he steps back and he sees the big picture. He saw he was defeated at the cross, and so he then began his effort to now create this uh, Babylonian religion, and Babylon the Great, in the book of Revelations, is the Roman Catholic Church. And the, the, the interesting thing, when you read the prophecies, she's writing a beast, and when reading through the book of Revelations, you see that the beast comes out of the sea. And this beast is symbolic of government. And what people have to understand is that there is a connection between the spiritual, okay, evil spiritual realm and government, because... What people lose sight of sometimes, and the public school system will not teach this, and that is that government is one thing and one thing only. As George Washington said, government is force. And so what the uh, battle on the great controls the force of government. She is seen riding the beast. The person who rides the beast controls the beast. And she is seen controlling the beast of government. So, and the, so this is the, Ju that, this is the Judaic, the Judaic uh, inspired uh, and, uh, and maybe even uh, guided entity, the woman, the Catholic Church, so in a sense, it's like a triad, isn't it? You have the the the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, Rome. You have a Jerusalem, uh, certainly not the new heavenly Jerusalem, but the earthly variety uh, that sort of infested the, the Vatican. Uh, and then they're riding the beast. And I wonder if that's not really the United States seems to be the leader of the world right now. Our Fed Reserve is liquefying the world with printed money, for example, uh, as this financial crisis uh, develops. So you, you, you have, uh, it seems like at this point in history, the United States, which represents the beast, although I'm, I, it is all of the whole world, all the nations, I totally agree with you. You know, Moses Hess, who was one of the first, uh, let's just say, Jewish communists, uh, wrote a book entitled, I think it was called Rome and Jerusalem. I think that's interesting. But do you remember, Ed, when the Jews, before Pilate, the Roman governor, he he tried to, to, to give them Jesus. He said, I, I find no guilt in this man. He's innocent. Uh, let me release him. Uh, and, and they cried out the more, the Bible says, no, 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 crucify him. And then Pilate said, would you have me to crucify your king? You know, because they, they had claimed that Jesus had said he was king of the Jews. And for that uh, he should die. And uh, so Pilate said, would you have me to kill your king? And the Jews cried out, and this is something I want to ask you about here. They cried out, we have no king but Caesar. Now, that's an interesting thing. So they accepted Rome and its monarch, Caesar, its dictator, you might say, Caesar, 
uh, as their king. They did, they have wanted no part of Jesus, rejected him. I, I wonder. I wonder if this is sort of the same thing. The Catholic Church, the the the, the Jews, are basically saying we want a world king. We we want a Messiah of the world, but we will not accept Jesus, the true Jesus. Would that be an accurate uh, statement? Uh, no, I think so. And in fact, that brings us right around to uh, what was just announced uh, this past uh, week or so uh, by the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace from the Vatican. Now, no. you have to understand, the, uh, the, the Vatican is completely controlled uh, by the Jews. They, the Jewish, the, the banker for the Jews are, is the Rothschild Banking um, Syndicate. And he who pays the piper calls the tomb. Hmm. Uh, the, 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 the way that the Jews control both religion and government is through their banking system. And I'll explain how that's done uh, in just a minute. But let's talk about this, this pontifical council, because in this uh, announcement, and they presented a document, they, they stated that they were calling for a global political authority, okay, that is a world government, essentially, and a central world bank. Um, you can't have one without the other. They, they go together. And so for them to call for that, um, it's without without a central bank that you cannot have a world government because that is how they amass their power and their control over the central government is through banking and and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when when they announced when they announced this uh, report, now who, who, okay, who is they? This pontifical the, the council. pontifical council, and it was Cardinal uh, Peter Turkson who actually held the press conference. So he's acting and, uh, basically for the the Roman Catholic establishment at the Vatican. So it's like a report from the Vatican, then. Well, yes, but interesting about this: this is a pontifical council. So the members of the council are appointed by the Pope, mm. and and remember, I don't I don't have to tell you to remember, but Satan is a liar. His minions are liars. And so the very first thing, the very first thing out of Cardinal Peter Churchill's mouth was a lie. He prefaced the uh, introduction of this report by saying it's in no way the opinion of the Pope. Now, why would he do that? Why would he say something like that? And he said it was reviewed by the Secretary of State, but the Pope had not read it. <laughs> now, that just doesn't pass the smell test, because this council was appointed by the Pope. The purpose of the council was to report to the Pope. And so he's coming out and saying, yeah, we kept the secret from the Pope and we're going to come out and tell you about it. Well, he hasn't even seen it. That makes no sense. It's clearly a deception. And the reason they're doing that is to protect the Pope from some of the revelations in the report. So this is sort of like the White House does. You know, like the recent revelations of the Fast and Furious uh, program where we actually gave over a 1,000 uh, deadly lethal uh, weapons uh, to the Mexican drug cartel. Uh, but President Obama said, well, I didn't know we were doing that. You know, that was the ATF uh, chief and all of his people. And and then, of course, uh, the, the Department of Justice uh, head, uh, uh, Mr. Holder, Eric Holder, said, well, I didn't know anything about it. So yeah, it's 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 called plausible deniability, isn't it? Right. You know they do these horrible things, but at the last minute, if things get out of hand or it's an embarrassment, they say, "Well, the, the top guy didn't really know about it." Even though, I mean, does he ever read the newspapers? Because I've got the New York Times, uh, <laughs> you know, an article of a statement about it, and I'm sure it was in the uh, the Roman newspapers and the. The sure. term, all the, in German language, in the you know the the Zeitung uh, newspaper uh, in in Berlin and Frankfurt or whatever. So this is an interesting thing, but uh, uh, I, I I think you've got a good point there. It's quite 
So this is the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace of the Vatican, appointed by the Pope, and they're calling for a global authority or uh, and a world central bank. Is this like world government then? Exactly, exactly. Mm. There, and and what is happening with um, with the inflation and credit issues that we've had. Um, and, and it's really getting bad. They're getting towards the end game right now. Uh. Uh, they and so it's it's they 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 have to come out and they have to do things uh, more directly than ordinarily they would do because they're running out of time. The system, their their financial system is collapsing. Uh, they have tremendous power. But it's based on an illusion. See, a witchcraft is based on deception. It, if they can get people to think that something that is not real is real, then they've won. Boy. And it's important for people to understand the nature of witchcraft and what it does and how they have... Now, use this illusion to create, for instance, a counterfeit religion, a counterfeit Christianity in Rome. They have created counterfeit money, okay? They go hand in hand. The counterfeiting of the money is very similar to the counterfeiting of Christianity. So this is, this is, like, the, this is like the Wizard of Oz, right? I mean, it's scary, it's huge, it's, uh, I, I, I mean... The Catholic Church has all this, you know, you visit the Vatican and all the statues and the bones and the marble floors and the gigantic structure of the building and the huge Egyptian obelisk out in the square and uh, the Vatican. I mean, the whole thing is St. Uh, what is it, Michelangelo's painting there in the Sistine Chapel. The whole thing, and then the, the, uh, the, the priests scurrying about with their black, a costume zone, looking like women, sort of, uh, running around and doing all the, it it creates then, according to what you're saying, sort of a, a, a an ongoing ritual of make believe. Is that correct? Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, and, and, and when you read the Book of Revelations, it talks about um, the 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 um, Babylon the Great being drunk. Okay and making the nations drunk, it's, this, um, this is a spiritual reality. People are deceived, and they don't see, they don't realize that what's really happening is they're being spiritually intoxicated in order to not see that they're being enslaved. And that's ultimately what their goal is, the enslavement of the world. Uh, people don't under, uh, understand for the most part, your listeners might, but most people don't understand that the communist revolution was uh, a, a Jewish revolution, a Jewish revolution from beginning to end. And uh, if you look at the characters that were behind the revolution, uh, it is the Talmud put into practice. You know, one of the first things they did was pass a law in... Russia, when they took over the, the, uh, the Russia uh, in the Communist Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, was to make anti-Semitism a capital offense. Well, I can the, well, it seems like Ed, uh, your <laughs> your book is going to put you right in line when they pass that act again in the coming New World Order, a supranational authority. With your book, I would say you're not going to pass the muster of the upcoming anti-Semitism act. I mean, you yeah, know, that, that, a, yeah, they, um, a truthful book like yeah. yours, that could get you in real hot water, couldn't it? Well, the, I mean, anybody who speaks out against the Jews uh, will be targeted. There's no question about that. But your book, now let me clarify something here for folks. Your book, if read and understood its scriptural basis by Jews and Gentile alike, could lead, depending on the the meekness of, of their, their, their will and their spirit, and they're want, wanting to know the truth, 
could lead to salvation and eternal life. It's not anti-Semitic at all. It's pro-Semitic. That's right. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. And I, I, I think you know what I'm saying yes. there. Yes. It, it's a life-giving he, book because you point to who can save a person, namely Jesus Christ. And this is really the theme right. of your book and the prophecies that, that lead to, to him as Lord and Savior, which I, I thank you for doing so. And, and you raise a good point, too, with regard to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is actually a, a tool used by uh, the Jews in order to keep their the, the rank-and-file Jews in line. Okay, so we have the hierarchy of the Jews that actually use anti-Semitism. They uh, fan the flames of anti-Semitism and they use it as a means to keep their own people in line. Uh, and so, in my book, I explain how that's done and why that's done. Uh, you, it, you know, the specific instances during uh, World War II in Europe, uh, it, they used it as a, as a way of driving uh, the Jews out of uh, Western Europe into Palestine. Uh, because they wanted hegemony in Palestine, they had to increase the population of Jews there. Um, but that's an interesting study in and of itself, and I discuss that uh, in the book. G- uh, Christians are called to love our enemies, and so our response would be to love the Jews, to preach to them the gospel, but in no way should we hide or shrink from revealing the deeds of the hierarchy of the Jewish people because they are engaging in in the type of conduct that can only be described be described as as organized crime um, and they the, the very things that they do the Roman Catholic hierarchy does uh, they have complete control over the Roman Catholic Church, and they they use their control over the Catholic Church uh, to force it to do things that they they want. But it's the Bible states that the love of money is the root of all evil, and there is a a sect, a group of Jews who love money more than anything. There is a hardcore presence within the Roman Catholic Church that has that same love for money. It is the root of all evil, and they're driven by that. This idea of a world bank is part and parcel of that evil goal, okay? And when you look at the document that they issued, their reason for having a central bank is that the, there's not enough regulation of the banks, and so therefore they want more regulation. They want less of a free market. They want the market to be controlled. Basically what they're calling for is for the government, okay, to have control, more control, over what you and I do, our daily existence. Okay, now, Ed, we're going to have to take uh, a break. I'm sorry to cut you off. We're going to have to take a short break here. Uh, and I'm going to let people know, in fact, how to get your new book. Uh, but when we come back, let's talk some more about that, what, what their goal is in issuing this 22-page report out of the Vatican, which says we need to structure basically the whole world. We need a world central bank. We need a supranational authority, like a political authority, a world government uh, as such for uh, more controls. Uh, and we'll get into that and, and the religious basis of it when we return. I'm with Edward Henry. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, it's been my pleasure today to have Edward Henry as my guest, and we've got another half hour to cover to get into this pontifical, I like that, pontifical council uh, for justice and peace. 
this new proposal by the Vatican to overhaul the world's financial system, set up a supranational authority and all, and I suppose the the Pope would like to be the head of it all. I'll have to ask Mr. Hendry about that. But I want you to have this book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great, Tracking the Beast from the Synagogue to the, to the Vatican. Man, this is a directory, an encyclopedia of knowledge that you need, my dear friends. Now, this is not one that you, you're going to, you know, take to the beach in, you know, in two hours uh, or, or to your little lodge while the family's skiing or something. I don't know. I don't go skiing myself, so, but I've heard people do. And you read it by the fireplace in one night. I mean, it's a book of study. It's well written, easily understood, even though. You know, Edward Henry is a great scholar and intellectual. He has written it for people like me and you. Anyone can understand it, but he, he wants you to understand it. And he, well, it's just, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I highly recommend this book. If there's one book that you get this year, this probably ought to be it. So now here's how to get the book. It's $30, okay, $30, add $5 shipping and handling. That's a total of 30 Is that right, Jerry? Jerry is telling me that $30 includes shipping. It's $30 total. Okay. Now, that's cheaper than even in the bookstores, so that's what we're going to do. If Jerry Barrett, uh, who's my uh, engineer over here, says so, well, I'm going to do what he says. You know, follow God and Jerry, and you can't go wrong. Okay, that's what it is. $30 for the book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Now, we have plenty of copies here, and I know that the author, Edward Henry, He's also the owner of Great Mountain Publishing, which publishes it, and he'll get as many copies as we need, okay, to us. So if you need more than one copy, don't worry about it. Your pastor probably needs a copy. If you have a pastor, you'll want to give him a copy of the book. He probably won't uh, appreciate you doing that, but he needs it, so give it to him anyway. And then tell him what he finds wrong with the book. Get back to you. Of course, he probably will not get back to you because, well, what can he say? It's scriptural. Okay. $30 that includes shipping and handling. Now you can call us toll free 1-800-234-9673 in the United States Monday through Friday during the workday. And a very friendly person will talk to you and they'll be delighted to send you the book. As for the book, just as for the book, Babylon the Great or the mystery of Babylon the Great. But the long title is Solving. I like that. Solving the mystery of Babylon the Great. Hey, I know so many of you out there love Bible prophecy. Well, here it is. Wow, you've got what you wanted. In fact, that's why I ordered the book in the first place, okay? I think Ed actually sent me a copy of it, and I scanned it, looked through it, and then I lost it. You know, it's like so many things. I lost it. I was looking for it. I got a little frantic and um, called him back and said, hey, I need another copy. <laughs> and he sent it to me. I think that's sort of the way it went. I later found the first copy and gave it to a friend. So that's, maybe that's the way God works to multiply things around. I'm not sure. In any case, I want you to have this book, $30, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great by Edward Hendry. Now, in a minute, I'm going to ask Ed, Edward to let you know his website because he has some other books. He has a tremendous book. It's the only book that I fully trust about the 9-11 incident, a work of, well, research. If you want to know what really happened, 9-11 and the Israeli involvement, the whole shebang, I mean, this is a masterpiece book. But he'll tell you how to get that on the, his website. You can order that book as well about the 9-11 truth, okay? And you can get, by the way, you can even get this book. You can buy both books at the same time from Edward Henry's website. But I'd like you to order it from my website. If, if you could, it'll help our ministry here and uh, keep everything uh, going. Now, 1-800-234-9673, and you can go to powerofprophecy.com, powerofprophecy.com. In fact, we have it right on our homepage. You'll find a picture of this book. Click on to it, and it'll describe it for you. You can order it there with a Visa or MasterCard uh, or other charge card, okay? They're on powerofprophecy.com. Now, Jerry, is any other way people can get it? Yeah, they can write to us. They can send us $30. And uh, send a check or money order or cash, put a little note with it and say, hey, Tex, send me Ed Hendry's great book, Babylon the Great. And I think you're going to be pleased that you ordered this book. You can always return things 
to us, but you know what? I mean, if they're in perfect condition and all that, right after you get them. We, ex- we accept things like that, but I don't think you're going to want to let go of this book. You know what I did with my copy? I got my, I always get my pen out, and I have little notes everywhere. In fact, I think I've written more on the pages than Edward Henry had typed into it at the printer. So <laughs> that's that's what I think about good books. You know, I get my pen going, and boy, I write all kind of little notes and ideas and thoughts and Bible verses and things like that. And that's what I did to this book by Edward Henry. Okay, let's return to our regular program. Our address, by the way, is Power of Prophecy, or simply text Mars. 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Okay, again, our address is Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Edward Henry, welcome back to Power of Prophecy. Thank you, Tex. You know this report that you were talking about with a really a world central bank, would this be like take over from uh, the, the Fed Reserve, or would it sort of just the Fed Reserve would be like a branch of the World Central Bank? Well, I'm not sure quite what the structure would be, mm-hmm. but certainly the same people that are running the Federal Reserve would be uh, running uh, the, the World Bank. The, the report doesn't get into really a, a detail on that, but I think we should talk about what it is that these central banks do, and the Federal Reserve is a, is a pretty good study of that because people here in the United States are pretty familiar with the money that they have in their pocket. So if they would just take out a, a dollar bill, for instance, and look at it, we can, we can discuss what it is these banks do and how they engage in this subtle witchcraft where they convince people that what they have is actually something of value when, in fact, it is not of value at all, okay? So if, for instance, you look at a a typical Federal Reserve note, it says that it's a Federal Reserve note. Most people don't understand, but they look at the money, they think it's issued by the United States government. It's printed at the Bureau of Printing and Engraving. However, the Federal Reserve is actually a private corporation. It is a private corporation. The money that is issued by the Federal Reserve is is issued as a as a debt currency. So what I mean by that is, when the government runs a deficit, and this is why we'll never cure our deficit deficit issue by law by the Federal Reserve Act, the federal government must now borrow its money from the Federal Reserve. So what the, the way the exchange works is this. The federal government prints treasury notes, which are debt obligations which carry interest. They exchange those notes for Federal Reserve notes. So at, you have two notes going back and forth. A note is a debt obligation. A note is a, an obligation by the person who issues the note to pay another person something of value, okay? When they exchange those, the interest-bearing treasury notes are received by the Federal Reserve. The federal government receives Federal Reserve notes that then they use to buy airplanes and pay for soldiers to go overseas and pay Social Security benefits and all the things that the government does. Now, before that transaction took place, those Federal Reserve notes did not exist. They came into being because the Federal Reserve Act requires the government to borrow that money from the Federal Reserve. So what happens is the Federal Reserve banks, it's a consortium of commercial banks, are enriched to the tune of billions and billions of dollars every time the government runs a deficit. And so while at the beginning of the year they didn't have, let's say the government is running up almost a trillion dollar deficit. Is, it, is that what the deficit is now? Uh, oh, no, I think it's way more. We're talking about $14 trillion. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the debt, and I think oh, yeah. well, understanding I the debt. Well, the, the deficit is $3 they trillion. Run every year. Is, is uh, if it's not, it's approaching a trillion dollars. Yeah, I think it's three trillion. That, You'll remember Ron Paul says he'll cut one trillion of that if he's elected. Yeah. In any event, it's a massive amount of money 
that the banks are enriched by. In other words, when the government runs a deficit, that is, the government could print that money and just put it into circulation. But what they do is they, get, they engage in this transaction where they become debtors to the Federal Reserve, who then takes the, the Treasury notes and sells them in the open market and so forth, but the, they have to pay interest on those notes. The Federal Reserve pays no interest on their notes. And so they issue notes, they pay no interest. The Treasury notes, they do, the government pays interest on that debt. Now, the government could simply print U.S. notes and not pay inter any interest at all, which is what Abraham Lincoln did during the Civil War. He cut out the bankers. They wanted to charge him 20%. He said, no, we're going to print our own money. And he did that. Now, people can argue about the constitutionality of that, but clearly what is going on now is unconstitutional. The, there is nothing in the Constitution that allows the government to print money, and therefore there's nothing in the Constitution that allows the government to authorize a private corporation to print money on its behalf. The, the authority of the, of the federal government is to coin money. They have the authority to coin money. Now, when the government does something like this and they issue these Treasury notes and they receive the Federal Reserve notes and they have an entity like the Federal Reserve printing paper money, this paper money, okay, is technically counterfeit. Um, and I know that's going to that's going to sound strange because people say, well, wait a minute, I've had Federal Reserve notes all my life, they look real. It's legal counterfeit, but it's not nonetheless counterfeit. Something that's counterfeit is, is an item that portrays itself as the real thing, but it's not. It's an imitation of something, and it, the intent is to deceive the person who receives it. That's what a counterfeit thing is. It's an imitation of something with the intent to deceive. And the Federal Reserve note, and the Federal Reserve issues Federal Reserve notes intending to deceive us into thinking that these notes are of value. And we have to accept them because they are made legal tender by law. So by law, people must use these and accept these Federal Reserve notes simply by the force of government. When we talk about a note being an obligation, what that means is, in the old days, the paper money actually represented gold and silver. And so when, it's, when somebody passed a note, that note represented so much gold and so much silver. And it said on the document, pay to the bearer, let's say, $20 in gold coin. Uh, over the years, they've taken off that promise. And so we have a note now without a promise. Now, a note without a promise to pay is not really a note at all. It is, in essence, a counterfeit note, because there is no promise to pay on it. We have been so used to using paper uh, as money that there's nothing of value be behind it. And here's the problem, and here's the problem the Federal Reserve and these central banks in various countries are running into. Because the value of the currency is determined by how much is in circulation, the value fluctuates from day to day, and typically it's going down. So, if you were to build your house, for instance, and you were to go to the store and buy, let's say, an eight-foot piece of lumber to build a house, well, if the next day you needed more lumber and you went to the store, but an eight-foot section was shorter than the day before, your house would be, it wouldn't stand, it would collapse. And that's the way the economy is, because every day the dollar has a different value. Because what people don't know is that a dollar is simply a measure. It's like a pound. It's like a gallon. Uh, it's like a foot. It's a measure. And it used to measure gold and silver, okay? $10 was 247 grains, uh, 247 and a half grains of pure gold. $1 was 371 grains of, and a quarter of pure silver. But when they, when they created the Federal Reserve and eventually got rid of the backing of gold and silver and simply have a dollar, that dollar has no meaning without a commodity that it measures. 
You know, if, if I were to ask you for a gallon, you'd want to know, well, a gallon of what? You ask for a dollar, a dollar of what? You want a dollar of silver, a dollar of gold? Well, if you take away the commodity, a dollar becomes meaningless. This is, this is like witchcraft. It's very subtle. And they are being enriched, and they're using this money to buy up corporations, to buy up politicians. I mean, think about it. They have such power. There's nothing that's out of their reach. And it's with this money that they're able to completely control uh, the government. Let me quote from what Andrew Jackson said, okay, with regard to our money system. He said it's an apparent from the whole context of the Constitution, as well as the history of the times which gave birth to it, that it was the purpose of the convention to establish a currency consisting of the precious metals. These were adopted by a permanent rule excluding the use of perishable medium of exchange, such as certain agricultural commodities recognized by statutes of some states as tender for debts or the still more pernicious expedient of paper currency. And John Maynard Keynes stated there's no subtler way, no sure means of order, overturning the existing, existing basis of society than to debauch the currency, which is what's happening now. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson warned about the banks controlling the issuance of money. He said if American people ever allow banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless in the continent their fathers occupied. And, and that's what's happening today. And these, the, the, the economic tumult that we're going through right now is simply the end, end game being manifested. They're trying to patch it as best they can. But this system will ultimately collapse, and it will collapse big uh, when it comes because they're trying to patch it up, and they can't keep it going. Okay, now, and the... the Chancellor of Germany uh, this very day, Merkel, uh, said that uh, she, she would like to see a new Europe because obviously the Euro whole Eurozone is in financial trouble and distress and is falling, you know, one by one. Portugal, Spain, you know, Italy, all of them are having bankruptcy problems practically. Uh, meanwhile, the, the Vatican comes out and says what we need is to replace the whole thing. Their carefully constructed, forged uh, New World Order since uh, Gorbachev and the uh, Bush particularly back in the 80s. So they have this new world order set up, very, very carefully constructed. The Bank of International Settlements, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, on and on and on. Of course, you have the Council on Foreign Relations and all Bilderbergers, all these groups. But something seems to be coming apart. The whole, the wheel is off the, uh, the vehicle, uh, so to speak. And, and you're mentioning that. But is it possible that that the mess that they're in, they will try to grab the brass ring, you know, uh, there at the merry-go-round, and try to pull off a new. In other words, can they charm the whole world and say, you know, this one's failing, but let's give you a better one. Let's give you a global government, a global-wide bank. You know, globalization is not the failure. These were the failures, and I get this, of nations of leaders of nations, but if we had one great leader, one great organization, one control, supranational over everyone, then we could help all the poor, the you know, the Occupy Wall Street, all of those people in need who need redistribution of wealth. We have the one percent wealthy and the ninety nine percent who were poor and poverty stricken. We can solve that problem. Is this what they've got in mind for us? Oh, I think that's that's what they have in mind, and, and it will be in it will be a tyranny. Uh, in the United States, in our U.S. Constitution, is an impediment to them. It is in their way. They have most laws that are passed now. Most federal laws are unconstitutional. Most of what they do is unconstitutional. They ignore, to a large degree, the limitations in the Constitution. But what we have here is a unique government in all of history. Uh, our founding fathers knew their history. They knew what would end up happening. And so they created a system which makes it very difficult 
for them to have total tyranny here in the United States. It has to be done gradually because it, the way the system is, it's so cumbersome. And our founding fathers intended that it be cumbersome that if they, if they move too quickly, the citizens will wake up. And some of these movements, I'm not totally convinced, are not controlled from behind the scenes by the very people that they're marching against. That's, that's a, that is a method that, is, that has been used, you know, by these powerful bankers, and that they've used it throughout the years to control both the opposition and, and of course, their, their own interests. And so if they can control the opposition, even though this group that is sitting in, in, in D.C. And, 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 and cities throughout the country, they're working feverishly, I'm sure, to gain control of that if they didn't initially start the movement. So I'm, very, I'm, I'm suspicious of any of these, these movements, really. Uh, yeah, I am, too. Uh, I, they're so easily manipulated by the rich, in fact. So they think they're uh, protesting against the rich when really the rich are the ones... <laughs> Uh, just like you say, the, the Jews are responsible for almost all the socialist revolutions throughout history, you know, since the days of Adam Weishaupt in the order of the Illuminati. So they, they fall right into the hands of the wicked. And, of course, the Catholic Church is able to marshal how many hundreds of millions out of the billion or so who claim to be uh, Roman Catholics, right? Yes. And they appear, they appear to be for the people. I mean, the Catholic Church, doesn't it come across as... We're for the poor. We're for the sorrowful. Trust and believe in us. The Pope loves you. Is that uh, sort of well, <laughs> well, good that, that, that is That is interesting, because if you look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and I'll quote from Post, Pope Pius IX, in 1864, he issued an encyclical letter, Quatra Coa. He condemned freedom of conscience as an insane folly. He condemned freedom of the press as a pestiferous error, which cannot be sufficiently detested. In his uh, syllabus erorum, he stated, No man is free to embrace, embrace and profess that religion which he believes to be true, guided by the light of reason. He was against that. Pope Gregory viewed freedom of conscience and the press as absurd and mad concepts, not only within the Church, but in society as a whole. The Catholic Church is, is so tyrannical. They are against freedom of conscience. They want to use the force of government the way they did during the Dark Ages to force people to adhere to their religion. And just as the, 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 the Jews did with Christ, they turn them over to the civil authorities for punishment if they, don't, if they don't adhere to their religious doctrines or they are suspicious of them. That's exactly what they did during the Dark Ages. They turned them over to the civil authorities for uh, torture and so forth. Marquis Lafayette, Okay, he was convinced that there was a Roman Catholic conspiracy. He said, if the liberties of the American people are ever destroyed, they will fall by the hands of the Catholic clergy. Richard Thompson, former Secretary of the Navy, stated in his book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, nothing is plainer than that if the principles of the Church of Rome prevail here, that is in the United States, our Constitution would necessarily fall. The two cannot exist together. They are an open and direct antagonism with fundamental theory that our government and all popular government everywhere. So we have a constitutional republic. This constitutional republic is antithetical to the Roman form of government, which would be a dictatorship with the Pope at the head. And we are viewed, the United States is viewed by Rome as the enemy. They have been and continue to view the United States as an impediment to their world plans for a world government and a world bank. Well, I don't know, Edward, uh, but now, now with the last three, uh, the three presidents we've had, look, Bill Clinton, uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush, and Barack uh, Obama, maybe they have sort of uh, already conquered that impediment, and now they're all sort of working together, you know, the, the civil the religious and the financial worlds are all coming together as one in service to Satan. Well, the, we still... In other words, they're going to do away with those freedoms that you talked about that they certainly did uh, abhor. But now, if they can get rid of those and bring everything together, wow, what a juggernaut that will be, huh? That's right. That's right. And, and they're, they're going to do what they can 
to bring that about. And I suspect that we're looking at another uh, attack, not unlike 9-11, being used by the agent provocateurs who control the government as a means of clamping down and taking away what is left of our few liberties. Mm. Yeah, I totally, and I totally agree with you. Because the system, the system they have now, you see, with this banking system, when they print money like this, uh, there comes a point at which so much money is in circulation that it becomes worthless and the system collapses. Typically when that happens, those that control uh, the, the money supply, the bankers, will in some way create some conflagration that will take the mind of the people off the financial issue and put it onto something else that is more threatening. And what is that? Typically it's war. Mm. Typically it's war towards the end game. So I don't, you know, unless something, something stops, uh, the way things are going now, it's looking very much like they're, they're trying to get this country involved in a war. And you, they're, they're saber-rattling like crazy over Iran right now. And even though Barack Obama has announced the pullout of our, uh, of our soldiers from Iraq, um, I, I don't know if, um, if it's a, a one step forward, two steps back type thing, okay, or rather one step back, two steps forward, I guess, from their perspective. Uh, and we'll just have to see. I, I, you know, they don't tell me what their plans are. The only thing I can do is, is look at what they're doing in the context of history and what has been done in the past in history. And it looks very much like they're trying to get this country involved in a conflagration because the, the system, their, the economic system is collapsing. The, the massive debt cannot continue. The government right now, the federal government, is completely insolvent. Yeah, it is. It's, just, it's, 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 it's artificially being propped up. They're printing money like crazy. And it cannot continue. It simply cannot continue. Well, the, 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 the Catholic Church says it has the answer, but obviously it does not. Edward Henry, mm -hmm. we're run out of time here. We've, we've covered so much material. Uh, would you mind giving your website where people can get your book? And not only that, they can also get your book on 9-11. And there's, I think you have a couple of other books besides. So give us your website, please. Uh, it's uh, mysterybabylonthegreat.net. Mysterybabylonthegreat.net, okay. Yep. And the uh, uh, my book on 9-11, okay, uh, which is 9-11 uh, uh, Enemies Foreign and Domestic, which reveals the secret evidence uh, censored from the official record that proves that traitors aided Israel in attacking the USA. Uh, and that's found at uh, www.911enemies.com. Okay. All right. Now, the first one is is called mysterybabylonthegreat.net, right? And the second uh, website, come again with that, please, because I know I, people uh, write it down. take a little while to write it the, down. The, next, the other one is www.911enemies.com. And that's the number 911, so 911enemies.com. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, Edward Henry, thank you again for being our guest today on Power of Prophecy. I, I hope, we can, hope we can get together soon. These are very momentous, trying times indeed. Folks, you've been listening to Power of Prophecy, and my prayer is that you'll tune in each week and discover the power of prophecy. <laughs>